just get over there. City manager. You good? Okay. Just want to make sure. Okay. <clears throat> we'll call the joint meeting of the Katadi City Council and successor agency to the former Katadi Community Redevelopment Agency open. This is January 28th, 2020 for our regular meeting for the city of Katadi. And can I have a roll call, please? Council Member Delisso? Here. Council Member Harvey? Here. Mayor Skillman? Here. Vice Mayor Moore? Here. Council Member Lehman? Here. Thank you. And then if you can join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. So we'll move on to item four, approval of minutes and notice of waiving of reading of all resolutions and ordinances introduced and or adopted under the agenda. Move to approve. Okay, a motion and a second. Second, now that my microphone is now on. <laughs> all right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays or abstentions? Okay, 5-0 vote, we'll go forward with announcements. Meeting orientation for new attendees and viewers. In conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted City Council rules, the meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the City Council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is a designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The City Council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the Government Code allows. However, if the City Council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the City Council or its members believe are incorrect, misinformed, or purposely biased. The City of Katati has special open office hours on Monday evenings from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. by appointment in the Community Development Department at City Hall as part of its, whoa, as part of its Katati Open for Business program. This program provides personalized assistance and information to developers, current Katati business owners, and those interested in starting a new business within the city. The Rohnert Park Katati Regional Library hosts events for all ages, including art exhibits, book clubs, and children's programs. All events are free and open to the public. For more information, call the library at 584-9121 or visit sonomalibrary.org. The Katadi Historical Society Museum is open regularly the second Tuesday of each month from 5 to 7 p.m., Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m., and by appointment. For more information, call 707-794-0305. Citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up at nixel.com or by texting your zip code 94931 to 888-777. Measure G supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at katadicity.org. We'll move on to item six, which is approval of final agenda. Are there any changes to the agenda? Thank you, Mayor. No proposed changes. Okay, thank you. So now we'll move on to citizens' business and public comment for consent calendar items. I'll read a brief introduction. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any items listed on the consent calendar or any member matters not listed in the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the Council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any items not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 2017-02, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person 
for matters not on the agenda, and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. The mayor may extend the time limit for reasonable time where disability accommodation has been requested. And I do have a few speaker cards. Um, the first is from uh, Jamie Zimmel. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Come on forward. Hi, um, I'm Jamie, and I've been a, my husband and I and my son have been a resident of Katari for 19 years. And I wanted to talk today about the, um, the animals at Veranda Falati um, Preserve. Um, I just um, have heard that thou, that the animals are going to be moved away. And um, since the animals have been here, it's just been such a value to the community. I personally and my husband have gotten so much um, joy and good feelings by visiting the animals. And we have seen so many people in the community feel the same way. And even visitors from outside of the community have commented and talked with my husband and I about how wonderful it is and so unique to have something like this in the middle of a, you know, a town. <laughs> and um, I recently started volunteering at the, with the animals, helping um, Nancy um, feed the animals and that type of thing. And um, I'm aware that the animals are supposedly going to be moved and then just magically appear uh, back again. <laughs> And I know that, you know, farming is complicated. I'm not sure what the council has in mind as far as all of a sudden all the animals have to be gone and then how are they going to, after a, a, a construction project, how are they going to just appear again? I, I'm concerned about that because I don't want to lose this, um, which I think is just such an amazing um, thing that we have in Katati these last several years, so that's pretty much it. Okay, yeah. thank you. And since it's not on the agenda, we can't really address okay. it, but we can, that came up at the last meeting. Okay. Um, so if you'd like, we can try to get some information to you okay. specific to what's going on. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, and then I have a card, uh, Mr. Barrich. And you said you wanted public comment and then also wanted um, on item 10, is that correct? Thank you. Good evening, Council. For the benefit of the public, my name is George Barrich. I'm a former city council member. That's what I actually wrote down on the speaker card, but for some reason the mayor just can't bring, bring it to herself to read the speaker card correctly. I don't know what the basis of the resentment is exactly, but we're going we're gonna to keep trying to do this. At the last city council meeting, I brought up the fact that, you know, are we using speaker cards, are we not using speaker cards, because I filled out a speaker card, and it, was, and it was not recognized. And the mayor says, well, I, you know, that's not my procedure. Well, you know, mayor, you're going to need some procedures. Hopefully we get some procedures from you while you're mayor, not after you're mayor. Now, if you don't accept responsibility of mayor, you're going to make up procedures as you go along. That's not good leadership. So we need to know whether you're going to read the names on the speaker cards or you're not? Or are you just going to make them up randomly, arbitrarily, depending on how you feel? If you want the respect of the citizens, you have to earn it. You don't earn it by lying, by swearing on de de declarations uh, to falsehoods, to making up face, making faces at the public when the cameras are not turned on you. You know, I don't come here to be liked. That's not my purpose in life. It's not my mission. I'm not a two-faced politician. I don't speak out of both sides of my mouth. I come here to lead. I come here to educate my city council members. I come here to hold you accountable to your promises and your transgressions. That's what I was taught in college. Now, exposing you folks is one of the most positive things a citizen can do. Despite what Mr. Landman says, it is the very basics of the, one of the first lessons in civics, high school civics. Recalling officials who've done nothing wrong except shown integrity and leadership 
um, is really your attempt to removing diversity of thought on a city body, leadership body. I think it's one of the dumbest things this city has ever done. Now, if I can sit up there as a city council member and not take a paycheck, then I think you people should too. Remember, sometimes when you try to do the right thing, it doesn't always work out right. So good luck tonight. And thank you for your comments. I've also got a speaker card. Um, is it Emil Huco? Am I even close in the pronunciation? Good evening, City Council. Emil Huco is the name. And the purpose of my uh, coming here tonight, it was sort of a segue to uh, a discovery that I was brought to my attention of a project that's being worked on in the city, and it was in our the community voice. And uh, and I thought, well, isn't that interesting? I didn't even know that it made the front page, but it did. And it, it had some concern about, he said he didn't know what was going on, and it was could have been a potential hazard to the, um, uh, the site. And uh, I actually uh, took a trip up to the paper just to clarify some of those comments in behalf of the city because uh, I've been working with a lot of the city people here and um, we've been working hand in hand on this project and they're fully aware. But it occurred to me in talking to the uh, paper that um, not always does the information trickle down or maybe trickle up on what's going on. So uh, with that in mind, I thought I'd just give you just a brief update on what what is going on, if, and if you can in, indulge with my little story here. It goes back, the uh, story started um, when the general plan was being developed, and I used to sit in these meetings listening to, uh, I think it was Oren Thiessen put forward some of his thoughts about the way the general plan could be. So at that time, I being in a real estate business, we, my brother, my late brother and I acquired that property on 8150 La Plaza with the intent to create a mixed-use um, development. Unfortunately, the market died. Commercial isn't really happening in many different areas and with the help of the uh, community development here, um, I learned that it was a possibility I could repair what was there as a single family home. So that is what is going on. But it's just a segment of the project that, that I'm hoping that will evolve uh, with the city's uh, community development's assistance. They sort of coached me or coached me into making certain that if it was possible to achieve the bottom floor, which is going to be the second floor. If you've seen the erection of the building there on 8150 La Plaza, so it could be adaptable for commercial. So in, in effect, it's on its way if it's possible. Okay. And just so you know, you're at the three minute mark. So I just oh, wanted to... Oh, I didn't know I had three right. minutes. I got, it says here. So with that in mind, I just want to be sure that everybody's aware that uh, this thing is going on and uh, there's more to happen. Uh, we hope to develop the rest of it out in a work-lived kind of scenario. So I thank you very much for taking the time and thank you for all the people that have been working on this. I know I've tried to set up a meeting just to bring you up to speed, but I thought it was a great forum to do it. So yeah, thank, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for your comments. And I don't have any more speaker cards. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in public comment? Yes, come on up. Are you Kimberly? Yes. Okay, you said about the water bill. No, I said it was something on the water bill. It was that was posted on the water bill. Oh, I'm sorry. We had an item about water bills. Oh, on my the apologies. So no, 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 that's apologies. Okay. Sorry, right ahead. I'm glad you clarified. Sorry. No, no, no. You're fine. Um, good evening. Um, I'm also here about the animal farm next door, and just um, 
listening to the fact that it was on the that someone mentioned it at the last meeting that you had. So my, my, my question is, is why isn't it on any agenda for the people to vote kind of what's happening over there? Um, I volunteer over there with my husband. I, my understanding is that the gentleman who started at Dustin took a job south, so the burden of responsibility with the animals and basically everything falls on Nancy. So she is a person who has not only stepped up for community outreach, in my opinion, but when you look at the kind of the world today with all the bad things that happen in it and neighbors not talking to each other and everybody closes their doors, it has been a complete community outreach, in my opinion. Um, I've met people that I probably wouldn't have met when I, because I worked out at the County Office of Education. Um, my husband is a senior manager at Costco, so we give back by providing all the fruits and vegetables um, that would not normally go to composting, so it's not costing anybody anything. And my understanding is that if they're going to be refurbishing that building, which is fine, why with such a large plot of land they can't move the animals to the side with an electric fence or something like that? So to, to tell people that the animals are going to be, may be back um, is kind of um, not being honest with the public. And I also understand that she got notification within the last day or two that she's got two weeks to get these animals out. And as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't gone to vote. People, a lot of people don't know about it. So I don't understand why it's not taken into consideration what it's really bringing to the community of Katati. You know, we're not huge Warner Park. We're not Santa Rosa. And it's really, really devastating to learn that this might not be a place where any animals are, where people can't come to get to know one another. And it's kind of the circle of thing, feeding the animals. They're being sold for food or for pets. And it's a real community outreach. And, and commu that's one of the reasons that we moved here, was because it's small and you do get to know your neighbors. And I pass it every day. Everyone works around here closely. So I don't understand what's not on the agenda. And while the community of Katati don't really know what's happening. And I, someone said, well, did you see it on your water bill that the animals are going to be leaving? And to be honest, I just pay the bill. I mean, I didn't really look at the, whether it was on mine or, or a neighbor's. But I think it should be on agenda. And I think that the public needs to know about it. And Nancy. It, she's the key, key person, in, and I, I met her through volunteering there. It wasn't, it's not like she's a, I've known her for years or anything, but seeing what she's done, I really think needs to be taken into consideration. Okay, thank you for your comments. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And uh, that's it for speaker cards. Anybody else on public comment? Anybody on consent calendar? Okay, I'll go ahead and close. Oh, I'll close public comment and consent calendar and bring it back to the council. Yes, Council Member Howard. Um, City Manager, I, I think it would be helpful to readdress um, to the public what the um, plan is for the farm because even though we've kind of discussed it before and and do have a plan for for fixing it and what's going to go forward in the long term and all that. Um, I think we have to keep saying it over and over again. So if you could Bless kind you. of stress that and maybe we can, you know, come up with some kind of signage while the construction's happening. I don't know. Um, but if you could kind of lay out the plan, I think that would be helpful. Yeah, so um, the city has entered into a license agreement with Farmster, which is Dustin DiMatteo. And that's, um, that's who the city has an arrangement with to operate the farm. The city is also currently um, has out to bid the reconstruction of the farmhouse and the water tower. The bids are supposed to open next week, and um, that construction will get going in February. So during the construction period, um, the animals um, will be moved off the site, but it's, very, it's a very temporary thing. I think everyone is of the same mind that it's very important to have animals on the property. Whether, um, whether they're Nancy's animals or someone else's animals, that's up to Farmster because they're the ones that are licensed to run the farm. But, um, but I, I've made it very clear, as well as the council's made it very clear, that animals are a key part of that farm and they're going to be important. So it'll, be, it'll only be a temporary hiatus in animals on the site. 
Yes, yeah, so just to be clear, I, it has always been our intention to have that, that intention has not changed, but we do have to get those buildings fixed up and we do have to concern ourselves with the safety of, of the animals that are out there during that time. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on to, to consent. It, it's not on the agenda, so we talked about it last meeting and then this meeting, and so we're just trying to get information out to the public. I, I would, um, so one thing I'd suggest is if... Um, okay, ma'am, we can't, we can't, this is just disrupting the meeting at this point, so just I, if you can hang on, excuse me, excuse me, the city manager is trying to address your concerns, so just hang on. So I, what I was going to say is I suggest if, um, if she wants to talk further, I'd be happy to talk with either one of you offline. But you can give your phone number to the clerk, and I can follow up, and we can talk more about it, and hopefully answer any questions you have. Okay, so we'll move on to item eight, which is the consent calendar items. I'll make a motion to approve items A, B, and C. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second on items A, B, and C. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays or extension of extensions? Okay, so that's a 5 0 vote for the consent calendar. We'll move on to item 9, which is direction on future agenda items. Does anybody have any suggestions this meeting? Not from this side? No. Okay. okay, then we'll move on to item 10, which is public hearing. Introduction of Disposable Food Service Ware Waste Model Ordinance. And I know we got some um, written comments as well, which are also on the dais and will be included in the agenda packet. Thank you, Mayor, um, members of the council. So um, this is an item that's coming back to you from uh, last, well, in November, or anyway, it's in the staff report. I'll get to it in a minute. But you've heard this before. We had a presentation. Um, the executive director from Zero Waste Sonoma had presented it, and um, uh, the sort of the rough outline of what this um, proposed ordinance would do is um, is it would ban styrofoam containers and styrofoam products, as well as um, limit um, single-use takeout containers. So the idea is to try to use reusable containers to the extent possible, and um, if that's not possible, then compostable or recyclable containers. So um, getting back to the start, back in, um, it was in 2018, the um, Zero Waste Sonoma, the Sonoma County, or Sonoma County Waste Management Authority created a polystyrene waste reduction ordinance, and um, it was, polystyrene had been identified as a, um, not only in Sonoma County, but really statewide and nationally, as a major source of pollution that needed to be curbed, and especially these days when there's many alternative products that are available, there's no, there wasn't a need in most cases to, ha to use, um, certainly single-use polystyrene. And um, the proposed ordinance is drafted largely from model ordinances um, that have been adopted in over um, 100 such ordinances in California. Um, this particular ordinance was largely modeled after ordinances in the counties of Santa Clara and Santa Cruz. The basic um, elements are that um, it would prohibit polystyrene foam service wear distributed by food establishments, um, prohibit single-use polystyrene foam products sold by retailers, require um, food establishments and food providers to provide recyclable or compostable takeout containers, and only provide straws and utensils upon request, and then um, allow for voluntary, or suggest voluntary takeout fees to defray the cost of disposable service wear and corresponding credits for customers bringing in their own reusable containers. And um, there was a survey done um, about, uh, of people in, in Sonoma County about what they felt about prohibiting polystyrene. That's in the staff report, but there's overwhelming support to do that. And, um, also in the staff report on page, uh, packet page 35, there's a list of jurisdictions and the ordinance status. Um, as, of, as of now, it's my understanding that um, Sebastopol and Healdsburg have adopted the ordinance and um, many others are on the cusp of hearing or adopting the ordinance. Um, so 
Uh, it was September 24th. That was the date I was searching for earlier. That's when the council had previously heard this as a presentation. And um, as you all recall, at that meeting, um, the council had directed staff to work with staff from Zero Waste Sonoma to reach out to Katati businesses and solicit input on the proposed ordinance and then return to the city council for further discussion and possible action, which is what we're doing tonight. In late 2019, um, we worked with the Katati Chamber of Commerce and they sent um, a email to all their members soliciting feedback on such an ordinance. And um, in addition, Zero Waste Sonoma um, used a list of businesses likely to be affected by this ordinance in one way or the other and um, did a direct mailing to them in 20, at the end of 2019. The list of businesses that were in that mailing are also included as an attachment to this um, packet in the staff report. Um, and one last thing, just as a just as a matter of sort of historical context, um, back in 1989, the city had previously adopted a polystyrene food packaging ordinance. This is in Chapter 8.20, which the copy of that ordinance is also attached in here to the to the staff report. And um, that ordinance was uh, more narrowly tailored to prohibit polystyrene for um, on city premises. So for the city wouldn't be purchasing it for its own um, own uses. Um, as you know, this it differs from the one that we're talking about tonight because this would be a community-wide um, ordinance as opposed to a municipal use ordinance. That's why, um, in one of the recommendations, we are we we would be repealing Chapter 8.20 and replacing it with a new ordinance because it's basically taking the place but expanding the scope of it. Um, So uh, you'll also notice in the ordinance that there's a, um, a one-year period built in to, um, to educate businesses about the appropriate um, single-use container products. And the phase in times allow is, is in there to allow businesses to use the remaining stock of any existing things um, that they have and then begin purchasing alternative products for the transition. And um, Zero Waste Sonoma would assist, be assisting businesses with this transition um, also attached in the staff report are some um, educational materials. So what's compostable and recyclable and what's not. And also a list of um, places where businesses can buy these products. So um, that was an important part of our discussion in September was, you know, okay, it's great to say we can't use these things anymore, but what are we going to do to help businesses um, make the transition? And so that's what Zero Waste Sonoma would put together um, to assist. And it's also on their website, but I included a copy in the packet. Um, I will add, um, I just glossed over this earlier, but um, from, the, from the, both the chamber email blast and then the direct mailing by Zero Waste Sonoma, there were, um, uh, we got two businesses that um, had responded with some questions. One was Oliver's Market, and they just asked, when are we doing this, so that they can prepare for it. And then uh, the other one was Park Avenue Catering. Um, they were looking for, you know, what, what are the alternative products, and um, they apparently found what they're looking for, and they they seem to be okay. So that's um, that's sort of the outcome of that outreach. And um, so after um, after if this ordinance is adopted after January 1, 2021, then the ordinance could um, the ordinance could be enforced. So the ordinance would go into effect in March if it was um, introduced tonight. But um, you'll, you saw in the text of the ordinance that um, actually any um, enforcement on this ordinance would be delayed until January 1, 2021. And like I mentioned earlier, that was intended to, um, to give all of our businesses time to kind of make the transition and learn what they can use and what they can't use without any fear of being you know, subject to enforcement during that period of time. And um, Zero Waste Sonoma, like I mentioned, would be helping with that. Um, once we pass, once we get into 2021, um, Zero Waste Sonoma would continue to work with businesses um, through that um, attached agreement, which is also that model agreement that's in the um, packet. So they would be um, doing education and also helping businesses that are struggling. So if there's, um, and it's all complaint, it, it's intended to be all complaint based. This is how it works in all the other communities in California, to my knowledge, is, um, you know, customers go into a business and they, like a restaurant say, and they're handing out styrofoam clamshells. And then a customer might complain 
to the city, and then the so Zero Waste Sonoma would work with that business and say, hey, you know, that's actually not allowed anymore. You need to move to something different. And here's a list of things you can move to, and here's where you can buy it. Right? That's the sort of the intent. Um, as a last resort, if, if working with them, if the businesses just really just don't want to do it and they just refuse to make any changes, then um, the code enforcement piece is a possibility. Um, you saw in the ordinance that there's um, a table of, um, of fines if, um, if, if it ever got to that point. That part of it would be handled by the city, the actual code enforcement part, if it got to that point. But Zero Waste Sonoma would handle all the education and sort of encouragement up to that point is the intent. Um, and then finally, the last thing I will say is that there are some products that there are just no um, uh, commercially viable alternatives at the moment. And sort of the, the poster child for that is um, coffee cups. So single-use coffee cups, um, you know, we'd encourage people to use re reusable, like bring their own mug. I know, I know most of you guys do that. And you know, it's becoming more and more common where people use their, uh, their own like um, reusable containers. But, um, uh, but short of that, for coffee cups right now, that's all they have is the paper cups or the plastic liners. And that can't be composted or recycled. So um, the, what businesses can do in those cases is they can apply, for a, um, apply to the city for a one-year exemption. and. Um, and so each year, the city would then exempt them from that requirement, assuming that there's a good reason for it. And um, Zero Waste Sonoma, I'm expecting, would be helping us with that because we're not, we're not experts in, this, in the field of composting and recycling. So um, they would um, help us truth those requests. And um, the intent of it being annual is that the technology is always moving. There's always new products coming into the market marketplace that could be eventually viable. So um, for now, though, businesses could get up to a one year. And, it, and they could ask for it again and again, each year, but it's year by year until hopefully something comes to market that could um, be used for a takeout container. And um, that is about it. I will just say that um, um, Sloan is in the audience here also. She's from Zero Waste Sonoma, and she'd also I'll be happy to assist with any questions if I don't know the answer. With that, I'd be ha happy to, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, and what I liked, too, about this is that it's, it's going to keep it consistent. So it's not like doing business in Utahdi versus doing business in Runner Park. We're going to have different rules. So that would be great to keep it the same. Um, so I'll bring it back to Council. Are there any comments for, yes, Council Member Delasso. Thank you, Mayor. Um, who knew that recycling would be so confusing? You know, it's just, it's amazing. But, um, and, and I'm sure county by county, there's probably different ordinances in place. Um, and, and as best as we can in Sonoma County, it's, it looked like Petaluma had approved something back in October, but it was slightly different. It wasn't the model. So, you know, hopefully that doesn't sort of throw too many waves um, into this. Um, and I just, I, I mean, I have some thoughts for later, but I just, uh, what I wanted to say was, you know, kudos to our staff and to Zero Waste Sonoma for getting out there, getting in front of this, talking to the businesses, um, and, and kudos, kudos to the businesses that are already doing, you know, I guess I'd like to say what they think is the right thing, because again, you don't really know if, you know, what I'm purchasing and stocking up in my my business now is really going to be recyclable. So uh, hopefully that will sort of work itself out. And I just remember that the two things I really wanted was that there was an al a choice of alternatives given to the businesses. So I think I use the term some kind of a catalog, but just something they can go to to then order the products they need that meet the, the spirit of this. Um, as well as the, the phased in approach. I think that's important too because it, it's silly, let's say you have styrofoam cups. I know cups are a bad example, it's styrofoam plates. And you know, you've got a stack of 100 of them. Well, it's really bad if you just throw them in the garbage, right? I mean, at least get them used once and then throw them in the garbage, I guess, right? That's gonna be the ultimate, uh, the ultimate fate for those things. So 
Um, thank you for bringing this back in a relatively quick manner. I really do appreciate the work that you guys put in on this. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Barbie, do you have a comment? I have a question okay. um, at this point. So um, the lists that are in the back, were they meant to be in, uh, were they meant to be complete? Uh, one, the one thing that kind of stands out for me is that we have Pete's in there, but we don't have Starbucks. And unless Starbucks has another name, which I know some of these big corporations have multi names, I, I w was unclear to me um, whether or not we have to do a little bit more outreach or not. So it could be just, I, I missed it and it's called something else, but um, that was a question I had. Um, I was a little confused by the dates because it looked like there was, uh, they weren't consistent. It said, um, in one part it said January 2021 we would enforce, and in another part it said January 2022. Um, I was unclear as to uh, which date was right. Are we waiting for two years or one year? Um, so that was not clear to me. Um, it sounds like we are leaning um, towards the enforcement being done by the city by code enforcement. I know that when we talked about this in September, it was a little unclear um, what we wanted to do. So am I correct that that's kind of the direction we're leading it, leaning in right now is that we'll do it through co code enforcement when it gets that far? Yeah, the, um, so um, on, that, on that question, when it gets to actual code enforcement, basically what would happen is, um, is Zero Waste Sonoma would be working with the business all the way up to that point, and at some point when they have, when I guess when we consult and they have determined like there's no, we can't go any farther with this um, particular business because they're not willing to participate or engage with us on it, then at that point, then the city would have to do the actual code enforcement piece of it. But all the pre, um, all the all that work in advance of that would be done by Zero Waste Sonoma. Okay. Um, and then um, we had also asked for, as um, Council Member DeLasso pointed out, you know, an alternatives list so people, you know, don't have to look it up on their own. There was a quite in extensive list of stuff in there. I think that that was uh, real helpful. Um, really good um, educational material, I think, as you pointed out, you know, this stuff is constantly evolving. So hopefully at some point there will be a solution for the plastic line cups that right now um, are a bit of a problem. But I appreciate um, all the work that was done by um, uh, the agency and staff to get us this far. I know that, you know, this, this is new. And I appreciate um, the Chamber of Commerce and all the businesses working together with everyone so that everyone was on um, on the same page. So I think that, that that helps when everyone can get their questions um, answered. And I think that it sounds like that went pretty well, especially since we only had really a couple questions. So, so okay, thank you. Any questions or comments for staff? Councilman Lane. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just wanted to confirm uh, exactly what the hardship exemption was at first. In reading this, I thought it might be an extension for businesses that were having difficulty perhaps getting rid of inventory even after a year. Now it sounds more like this is an, not an extension, but it is uh, an exemption for items where there's not a viable replacement. Is that a better description of what we're doing with the one, potential one-year hardship exemptions? So um, it's my understanding that it's based on um, not a commercially, a readily commercially available option for Good. them, as opposed to, you know, I over order, you know, like a year later they hadn't, they still have stock. Good, good. That makes sense. Obviously, we want to have a good balance between being helpful to businesses during a transition. At the same time, you want to, don't want to be in a position where something so weak it allows gaming of the system, because that destroys really the whole benefit, which is to have something unified that businesses everywhere have a level playing field and the county as a whole reaps the benefit of having this uh, elimination of some of these products. So thank you. That was helpful to hear. Any questions for staff? Councilor? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. Um, no, I think it's great that you brought it back in a timely manner. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a good start and we'll go from there. 
Okay. Did you want to follow up with something? Yeah, just um, just two questions from earlier. I just would follow up real quick. Um, one is about the uh, the effective date. So um, so in the or in the draft ordinance, it um, assuming it's introduced tonight, it would go in, it would actually go into effect um, in March, like mid March, right? Um, but the enforcement piece of it would go into effect. It, it been, essentially, be effective come January 1, 2021, is how it's written in the ordinance, which is what the reference was. Um, and some of the other packet materials, I think this is the, uh, and maybe Sloan can help out with this, the, um, the presentation from Zero Waste Sonoma said January 1, 2022. Um, but that, that seems a little far out there. Based on our previous discussions, we had discussed a one-year sort of... Um, you know, like phase in period, not a two years. So I, I assume that that was probably just a typo in the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the other question about um, the businesses. So um, we reached out to. You know, I, I can't say that we reached every single business, but we reached you know certainly you know ninety something percent of them at least. So I think I think the feedback we got is representative of what their concerns might be, and when we start, um, if this moves forward and we start when we start going to the education phase, we'll make sure that if any, if we did miss anybody in this initial outreach, we'll certainly catch them during the educational piece. But it was a pretty broad net that we cast for their initial list. Okay. So with that, I'll open it up for a public comment. Um, and I do, yes, Mr. Birch. I want to thank uh, the staff for a very good report. It's been a long 15 years. It's been a long 15 years. I look back at a man that had a little more hair back then, but the year was 2004. And I uh, was campaigning door to door, and I had a trifold brochure for my campaign. And one of the promises I wanted to make, and I did make, was to ban the non recyclable polystyrene food containers and also styrofoam packing material. I didn't win that election that year, but I did come to the city council the following year, and I did bring it up to the city council that I'd like to see them put that on the agenda. They didn't want to put it on the agenda. Sometimes, you know, if it's not your idea, it's not going to make it onto an agenda. And then John Gardino ran for office. I spoke to, with John about that because I walked door to door with, for John to defeat Lisa Moore. And he wasn't that interested in that issue as well. He said, I don't think we want to do that. I went before the coalition to protect Katati's future. They didn't seem to feel that that was uh, something they wanted to get behind. But I wanted to see the city set up a couple uh, dumpsters outside to recycle the uh, packing material. In the last 15 years, we don't know how many tons of that material has gone into the landfill. But here we are tonight. And it's, uh, it's very interesting uh, what can happen when people are blinded by their political hate and resentment for ideas that sometimes are not their own. For, for ideas that are future looking, that are ahead of their time. But here we are tonight, and I'm not looking for any proclamations to come at the next city council meeting regarding I was the one who pioneered this in here in this town. But the fact is that we're, we're here, and it's better late than never. We had a chance 15 years ago to be the leader, to set the pace you know, as one of the cities in the Bay Area, but we just didn't have that kind of support. I don't remember any of you being at those meetings. Uh, maybe Ms. Harvey was, Mrs. Harvey was there uh, when I brought it up or remembers that in my brochure. But um, it's an interesting um, uh, issue to see how these issues will come full circle. And oftentimes these, uh, the solutions come from the minority view. All right, thank you for your comments. I also have a speaker card from uh, Jenny Bleeker. And we did get your written comments as well. Thank you. These are the answer. 
and they're available at Atna Bazaar in Katati for a very reasonable price, about $10 or something like that. And we always try and remember to take them with us when we go out to restaurants and takeaways and potlucks and things. So I think that's where we should really be heading. Um, I'm sure you'll support the ban, and I hope you'll make it as strong and effective as possible, and also include banning plastic drinking stores if possible, so they're not just optional, but not an option. Um, I do think, I, I really appreciate the work that you've been doing and that Zero Waste has been doing on this. I went to the Zero Waste Symposium last year and it was very inspiring. Um, and I do think we do need to have a lot more education about what is and what is not biogradable and compostable, because most people who really want to do the right thing don't know that you can't put paper cups in, that they won't compost, won't biodegrade, and have to go in the trash. And the same goes for the um, um, silk fork spoons, knives, etc., made of corn and that kind of thing that people think are recyclable or compostable, and they're not. And um, as I mentioned in the written comments, um, if anyone's organizing events, I really um, would suggest getting advice from Green Mary, who does a fantastic job of greening and making w uh, big events zero waste. I once went to a breakfast she'd organized for 300 people, and at the end of it, there was one metal-lined tea bag that was the only waste. Everything else was reused, composted. Um, it was fantastic. I'm sure we should be able to do that all the time. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Um, and that's it for speaker cards. Does anybody else like to speak on this item? All right. Seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to the council. Any further comments or questions? Yeah, Councilmember Landon. Yeah, just very briefly, I'd be very supportive of being uniform in uniformity with this ordinance and following the model we have. I think that's where we get the most benefit out of it. Uh, and it seems like the majority so far, at least the cities have done it, have been most of them have been able to follow that, so I would hope we would. And I think somebody mentioned earlier change in public perception. I think perhaps it was our outgoing mayor mentioned it, that here we are. And, and I, I do have to say, it is kind of nice to see we've got to a place now Difficult as this can be uh, for somebody busy running a business to have to make a change in supplies and the way we do things because we're human beings and we don't like to change our habits, that everybody's got to the point they recognize, no, this has to happen, and there's essentially agreement, uh, and that's the place we need to be. Maybe we should have been there a long time ago, but I'm glad to see we're here now. So very supportive of this, and we'll support it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. Councilman Rahari, go ahead. I was just going to move it forward. Oh, no. Well, I did have another question. No, um, as I referenced earlier, um, it's a start. And is there a particular reason why we did not include plastic straws? Um, so perhaps Sloan can give some more background on this. But the way, um, as you know, the way the ordinance is written right now is um, it's funny. I was thinking about this this weekend. I was at a I, was at a, I um, stopped at a, a restaurant and and uh, is in Santa Rosa, and they had styrofoam clamshells, which I hadn't seen in quite a while. And also, they gave you straws without asking for it. Um, and both those thi both of those things, talking about the cultural shift, both of those things caught my attention because I just didn't expect a styrofoam and you know a straw, but. Um, the way this the way this ordinance has been developed, and um, I know there was there's a lot of background to it at the waste agency, and it went through a lot of stakeholder review, is my understanding. But um, the way it's drafted is that uh, restaurants would no longer provide straws; um, you'd have to ask for them. So it would that, and it's that one step in itself um, would be expected to reduce quite a quite a bit of straws that are just sort of involuntarily inserted into drinks now. Um, so, um, yeah, so I don't know if you have anything to add to that in terms of um, the involuntary, the way it's written is involuntary, um, you have to request a straw versus just an outright. Come up to the mic. 
you want to come up to the microphone just so yeah. that, that way it's on that's okay it's on the record that way uh, so city manager is absolutely right um, the idea is that without requesting it people will not be getting them in the, the same volumes that they are right now so really effectively that just absolutely minimizes um, the, the just sheer number um, there, there would be an exception because this just recently came up uh, with drive throughs um, there's a health and safety concern uh, by not providing the lid and straw on you know with that actual um, driving through because of spills and um, the county has said yeah health and safety uh, supersedes the straw and lid by request um, that would be part of the ordinance um, that that's just where we're at right now but as far as the straws by request Can't, yeah, yeah so sorry I, I just want to Harvey and also follow up uh, yeah, to add I, to, to I, what John has said thank you for the information on mm -hmm. there but when you talk about minimize um, you'll have a minimal use of those mm -hmm. we are don't we do we know what kind of numbers those are I, mean, I don't have the I don't have that with me okay and then we don't have any drive-through food places in Katani we do. so we, um, we that shouldn't be a concern here so okay in, in my opinion I think that we should add that to this particular ordinance and give it a little bit more tea uh, because since we don't have any drive-through restaurants um, in Katani which are you would, suggesting adding what, how would you uh, like to proceed with like changing the ordinance itself well if, if it's a, a draft ordinance at this point I would like to suggest that we incorporate the, the um, plastic straws into that and give, have that you know <clears throat> uh, nine month break-in period or whatever maybe the, the only issue there that I have a little bit like the yellow caution flag has just gone up is if you've got a business that's in multiple cities within the county but then it's slightly different that's going to be a problem I think for the business right whereas so it's it's almost a moot point of the for the drive-throughs in Katati we get that part but if you walk into a Starbucks or a Pete's and you want to get an iced coffee or whatever um, that would be the point where they're I'm assuming they would not be giving you a straw you would have to ask for it that's how the model ordinance, I believe, is stating it now. I, I conceptually, I'm right there where you are. I think it should be stronger, but I think it would have to go countywide to be stronger. And maybe that's some addendum that you know should come on to this ordinance. I mean, we only right now it looks like there's three cities. Katati would be the fourth out of nine cities. So I think it's got a ways to go. There's, there's one city that doesn't even have anything scheduled at this point in time hmm. mm -hmm. so so I would just throw a little caution to the wind on that I'm just concerned that if it's not the same countywide it's a little it's potentially not so much harder to enforce because that's done by jurisdiction but harder to implement for the business that's my concern well and to add to that as of right now there's not a really good replacement so a lot of the um, paper and other um, materials that some of the other straws are made out of they're just not there yet they're not holding up so that that's been some of the issue is kind of like the paper cups with the plastic lining there's there, it's just not quite there yet some places are are putting paper straws in but they won't hold up for say a milkshake you can't have a milkshake and drink it out of it they just collapse so there's more work to be done to get there and I have faith that um, technology will get itself there it's just kind of not there right this very second I suppose it will happen but through the mirror a question yeah. and, a, and a comment on, on this subject because I think it's a good one I'm glad you brought it up um, first of all before we get away from it I just want to be clear, the county's logic for bypassing this straw and lid ban for drive throughs is, is they're worried about spills, so they want to make sure they put a straw in this so you can't spill it. That's a safety issue? No, that, that was just something recent that was a development um, as part of some outreach um, and working, speaking with the different stakeholders that are involved. Prior to that, 
Um, my understanding is it came through stakeholder meetings and there was enough pushback that it, was, it became um, this um, idea of on request only, um, that that satisfied. No, I, I thought I'd understood from you that the county was planning to exempt drive-throughs uh, from the strong lid ban that they would automatically be given and I thought you mentioned something that was a concern about safety and that they had viewed on that. Um, I'll just explain that this came through uh, McDonald's um, and they up in Windsor. So this was something. They threatened them with a the clown with the big shoes. That's, that's <laughs> probably good enough. Okay. I just wanted to touch on that because it didn't seem logical to me, but that's the county. I guess it goes back to the whole value of pick something as strong as you can and stick with it and keep it consistent. I mean, I think what I'd suggest at least is I think it would be nice if we had numbers, but we're guessing. But I do agree, I think a very high number. <laughs> Who really usually asks us for straws? A few of us might occasionally like them with a drink, but will we even think to ask for them? No. I think the one exception might be if you're at one of our fine hamburger establishments in Katati and perhaps really putting on the calories and have a milkshake as well, you'll want a straw, because if you, and you'll want a real straw, because if you don't, you'll collapse your head trying to drink the thing. But I think for the most part, it'll vanish. But I do agree that's still kind of weak. There's ways around it, like Mr. Delasso just showed us. If you have your straw, my wife has a metal straw, you can do that. I wonder, since this gets most of it out of the way, if we could do this and then ask Zero Waste to come back to all the cities and clean this up and get it with a small modification after this first year. Because that way, hopefully, all of us will be on the same exact plan, and we can all, hopefully, most of it modify at the same time and pick this extra thing up, too. And that also gives people a little time to get used to it. Mm -hmm. Just, just a suggestion, because I think it's a good place to go, and I'd like to see it happen. I think this gets rid of most of it. Obviously, there's more to do, and uh, maybe that's where we can get there and still maintain the uniformity of this plan, because I don't want to be like the county, uh, changing it, whether it's for, in my opinion, a weak reason, perhaps, like the county apparently did, or even in this room for a, a good reason, but then if we have something that's kind of a jigsaw pattern all over, we lose that key benefit of having the same rule for everybody, and all businesses have a level playing field, and uh, which is what we off we expressed to them we were going to do. So, just a thought. Okay, yeah, Councilman Tulasa. So, um, just a couple of other comments, and there there are alternatives, there are solutions to plastic or even paper straws. This, if you can hear, is actually food grade metal with some kind of a rubber tip Gosh, that's bent. Silicone. Silicone, that's the word I want to thank you. Um, so there are alternatives out there. I mean, it's going to cost you money to buy one of these, but I've been using this for over a year, and it's clean because it comes with like a little bottle brush kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So there are alternatives, and, and it can be done. Um, it's just a matter of taking that extra step. Uh, just a couple of points I wanted to make, though. This is very similar to what came about some 30 plus years ago with reusable bags. People were shocked when they thought they had to go to a market and where's my paper bag? Where's my plastic bag? Even more convenient, right? Because those were like the perfect size for your kitchen garbage cans. And now it's second nature. I, it's, it's rare, I think, that I see when I go grocery shopping that I see people that don't have reusable bags. They may not have brought enough, but they've got them. So I kind of think that's where we are right now with, with all of this. Um, and, and a question I had about new businesses, um, assuming this is adopted by the City Council this evening, um, is there, is your, your presentation to somebody coming in with a new business that's potentially going to use these types of products, is the city now ready or soon to be ready and prepared to say, by the way, we have this ordinance, so if you are coming in and you're some kind of food service business, you know, here, here's what's allowed, here's what's not allowed. And I just want to make sure that city staff, when they are talking to potential new businesses, that that word gets passed on to them. And I'm sure that's the case, but I just I did want to point that out because I think that's really important. So, um, I mean, comment-wise, that's just what I wanted to add. Okay. Um, anything else? 
to be added on the side. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I keep saying council. I get it. I'll get it eventually. Vice Mayor Moore. It's okay. John's fine. Okay. Um, I think the argument regarding um, the consistency with businesses, or you know, if you've, you've got a business like um, Pete's or Starbucks or Oliver's, um, they're not going to leave because we said you need paper straws or an alternative to the plastic straws. I don't think that that's going to occur. Um, and I do think that, that uh, if you look at a business like Amy's, who uses those paper straws and they make milkshakes, um, they seem to be doing fine. So I, I really think that it would, if we don't do something now, it's pushed off down the road. Um, I, I look at an example of when there was a conversation about becoming part of, um, initiating part of uh, Sonoma Clean Power. And, you know, there was some pushback from some folks that, you know, maybe we're the small city and we shouldn't be doing that. I think this is an opportunity to lead the way and say, look, this can be done. And you've got a year to enforce it and potentially have that uh, effect. And, um, and it's not going to be a significant burden, I don't think, for our community and our businesses. And then the other cities might go, okay, well, maybe that's time for all of us to do that. So I think we should take the lead. Yes, Councilman. A question for that, because it certainly wouldn't give me heartache if that's the direction we went. Uh, but the big concern would be one of the things I read from the staff report, I'm sure we all did, was a concern about making sure we had uniformity to make sure that it was easy for zero waste to manage. Uh, would that small change, even if it's a big change in some of our minds, would that be problematic in any way there? Would that be a substantive enough change that it would make it difficult for you to do what you need to do for us in contract? And I'd like to ask you that as well as staff, if anything comes to mind right away where that would be problematic. From my perspective, that wouldn't make a, a huge difference in terms of education outreach and um, ultimately that technical assistance that we'd be providing. Mm -hmm. And I should ask, I think our, our representative from the Waste Management Agency, too, I'll ask three people. I'd love to hear from all of you, whoever wants to chime in, because that, that would help inform me. Well, so I'll repeat this. I've repeated it multiple times. We are heading down a path, which I said was going to happen when we went down this path of model ordinances. The reality is, by having model ordinances rather than having the agency do the ordinance and take care of it is that each community can take that ordinance as a um, draft, if you will, and modify it um, as their city sees fit. So there's nothing wrong with that, but it will mean that our city staff will know what our agency has and Zero Waste Sonoma will have to start keeping a spreadsheet or a whatever that says, well, in this city you have this, this, and this. In this city you have this, this, and this. And this, you know, if they're going to do that education and outreach, they will have to tweak the educational materials and they will have to tweak the outreach for each community as they change it. So it's just. I want people to understand that, that there is a cost associated with that by having non-consistency. Non and are we looking at any sort of substantive cost just to point out that in some communities, because I wouldn't be surprised if other communities followed us if we did this. Um, looking that at would this make right it now, easier. That's I can take a look here. I can see easy. about three, at least three that would probably follow behind us and a couple that just might not, uh, just yet. But, uh, is this something that does at our best guess right now? And do we think induce a cost? Because I, I agree, I understand the possibility. I'm not sure yeah. this is big enough to do that. Um, Council Member Harvey, thank you for your comments. Um, I, I do want to say uh, you're absolutely right about uh, just an initial added time that would have to go into modifying um, some of those outreach materials. Um, however, we're in the business of you know diverting waste and plastic straws you know, it's a concern. Um, and so if the city of Katati is you know, ready to move forward on something like that, um, from, from where I sit, I think I applaud that and I think that that's um, um, a good move. Um, so kind of if that is what you would like to do, we will support you in that. I mean, it is your 
city and you want to look out for their best interests and being a pioneer in terms of waste diversion, um, you know, it's commendable. So you're not seeing that as something that would perhaps be usually impactful in terms of cost either with the changes to the materials? I don't think so. And I understand that I'm just asking you to make a, a best judgment at this time. Good, thank you. Um, so I will, I will also just add that um, um, I would have to work with Zero Waste Sonoma to find some compostable type products that are usable. I, I know there's paper straws. I think they're awful, personally. <laughs> I mean, they, I, but, they're, but I have seen in other places like a bamboo mm -hmm. straw, mm -hmm. yeah. something like that. that. I mean, something like that would be much more feasible, in, at least in my mind. Because I, I, use, I use paper straws, and I think they're just horrible. Um, and and, and um, most people hopefully bring you know the, uh, the reusable ones, but that's going to be a mo that's going to be a ten-year process before people get in the sort of mode of bringing steel straws. I think. So, just to comment on the on the paper straws, there there are communities that that prohibit plastic straws, including communities that have In-N-Out burgers, which have milkshakes, and and they do have a they do have a paper straw. It's not your the paper straw you're used to. It, it doesn't work as well as a plastic straw, but it, it works. It doesn't collapse. Um, so the product is out there, just okay. so you know. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's kind of amazing that we're really worried about, you know, sucking a milkshake through a paper straw. <laughs> I think the general public is just going to have to kind of figure this out, and we can move forward. And so I'm glad that uh, the vice mayor brought that point up. And, um, but Mr. Gloss, if we don't stand up for milkshakes, who will? <laughs> I don't know what to. I don't know how to respond to that one. Um, I, so on, on the milkshake question, I will say that that um, probably the direction most people would go is they would get a lid that you can sip, and just not deal with a straw at all. Um, for things more viscous fluids like milkshakes, um, you'd want something seriously strong that would, you know. I mean, I, I don't know what kind of paper straws they have in Alameda, but I've, I've, never, seen, I've never seen a decent paper straw. But yeah, he'll, so, he'll bring paper straws in for a demonstration. Well, and we'll all suck milkshakes through them and see if they work. Milkshakes next month. <laughs> so it just. But, but, I, but anyway, I do know that there, there, all, there are alternatives. I mean, I have, I have personally used bamboo straws, which I think work just fine. And they don't like immediately collapse and dissolve on you. Um, and then, of course, there's a the thing like um, Councilmember Del also had. Well, People then, remember to bring it. And then just a procedural question, um, and maybe this will be from Mr. Bacher as well. Would we need to um, work with Zero Waste to come up with language to include in the ordinance? Or is that something that we would just, off the top of our heads, include? Or are you looking at a place right well, now? I, just, I, I, don't I, know I was looking at the ordinance to see if there was a change we need to make. I, um, on page, I guess it's packet page 97, um, there's a section number 8.20.060. If you look at subdivision A, it says all food providers util utilizing any disposable food service ware shall use, when available, a compostable product. If you look back at the definition of disposable food service ware, it includes straws mm -hmm. yeah. already. So, um, so like, I think the ordinance already covers it, but if you skip down to D in that section I was just quoting from, it says all food service providers shall only provide straws, lids, cut cutlery, and to-go condiment packages upon request. It sounds like the intent was to uh, continue to allow plastic straws, um, but the way it's drafted right now, it, it would actually, if, if, if compostable straws are available, um, businesses are required to use those. I think we just want to clarify that uh, it covers plastic straws. We could add, um, a, a, make a slight change in subdivision A to say all foods, all food providers utilizing any disposable food service ware, comma, including straws, comma, uh, shall use when such products are commercially available. I think that would cover to make clear that we're intending to include straws. Um, one thing I would point out is we haven't done any outreach about um, about straws, and the business community might have a concern about it. Since this thing isn't going to be enforced anyway until 2021, you could introduce this ordinance in the current form, do some outreach, 
and then come back and we can make the change in the future. So that's another option for the council to consider. I didn't talk to Damien about that. I usually try to do that. But, uh, well, and like you it's said, another but, option for you. So, so just to be clear on that, your, um, that suggestion would be an introduction tonight with some amendments, but then hold it? Oh. No, I was, I was suggesting a completely different alternative, just introducing it in the form that was in the packet, the way it was, uh, the way the outreach was done on it. Um, introduce it, have it go into effect. Um, it would go into effect, but it would just kind of be on paper only because we're not going to enforce it. And then at a later date, Damien could do some outreach about the idea of, of banning paper or plastic straws and then come back at a future meeting introducing an ordinance that would prohibit plastic straws. And it would go into effect, uh, the, the new rules would all go into effect at the same time as the council adopted the Mayor? second ordinance. Mayor, may I ask a question? Well, yes. Our council is rolling on that. He's doing really well. Why? Because it seems like the language would allow the ban on straws, kind of as it's written in subsection A there. That's how I read it, yes. Right. Well, I mean, that it does, it, it's a food service item. Um, couldn't we, if, you know, again, through education, the businesses, you know, will, will be told it includes the straws, so you can't use those anymore. Giving them a year, can't we just grant another exemption in January of, of 2021 if we find out there's still this glut of plastic straws? I really doubt it, um, but you know, isn't that another option where we can kind of give them another, whatever, six months, eight months to get through their inventory? Is that not an option available? I think that option would be available. One thing I want to ask Damien about the outreach is whether, do we specifically tell the business community that um, plastic straws will continue to be allowed? So we're having a dialogue here on microphones. Um, so it, it was, um, it, the outreach to the business is basically characterized it as you can use plastic straws but only on request. So it, um, it wasn't, overt, but that was how it was, basically how the ordinance reads, right? Um, and I think that's how it was understood probably by the people that read it. But if I were a business and I heard that, I think I would start to back down on large quantity reorders. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, if I were in that business and I heard that, that, you know, it, it's only going to be on request, well, all of a sudden you, you're cutting way down on my inventory, so I'm going to start to dial that back a little. I, I'm, I can't speak for any business is, that's thinking like that because there was two and a half pages of businesses listed, but I would guess that might be what they're thinking. So maybe this isn't, maybe we're looking too much into this, you know. I think we need yeah. to move it forward. And again, if we find out in January of 2021 that there's another handful of businesses that still have a, a larger amount or an amount of plastic straws, we could grant them an exemption to get through those. It's just an option. Madam, through the mayor, if I might question, since we're giving our city council some work to do here tonight, uh, putting you on the hot seat, as it were. So we're introducing this uh, proposed ordinance tonight. It, it would not be unusual. Would it be a problematic for a council to introduce an ordinance and perhaps when it comes back for its final reading to see changes made to it? Uh, well, if you did make sub substantive changes at the next meeting, you'd have to start over again. You'd have to introduce so it, would it be that a third night meeting. and okay. then bring it back again. And then secondly, is there any legally prescribed time frame that requires us a certain amount of time between introduction of an ordinance and bringing it back for that final meeting? No, no, there's not. Um, there's, a, there's a time. In, if you can't have the final reading uh, sooner than five days after it's introduced, but you can bring the final ordinance back at any As a typical elected official, I was looking more at dragging my feet rather yeah. than jumping out early. You can drag your feet. So my thought is I'm kind of in agreement. If we wanted to do this tonight, we could do this. We're only introducing the ordinance. This will give us some time for the community to get some output, get some input on this to hear, to come back to us if we need. Uh, we could, depending on what feedback we get, we could let staff judge when to bring this back for a final reading. And if there's something we've missed, if there's some new problem we've created, uh, or if we just need to hear more or there's more time necessary, 
then we can extend it to a third meeting and be done with it. But I think what will happen, as I suspect, is our outgoing mayor said, we might be reading more into it in an effort to be careful, I suspect. It'll probably be workable for our businesses, and it, it makes sense to get it done all at the same time. So I, I will say something. We hear from time to time that we all think the same way and vote the same way, and it's funny. I came in here reading this tonight. I felt very strongly that I wanted to follow the same or the model ordinance because I saw the value in that, and I do. But this is the value of discussion, even if it takes time in his perhaps even boring is watching paint dry for the audience, is we go over all the options and it changes votes because it has changed mine tonight and I'm supportive of this. So I, I think that's probably a good thing and I want to point that out. That's the point of these meetings and the public input and the discussion. So I'm looking to hear what the public has to say, but if, if there's something, unless there's something I'm missing, I think the pluses probably outweigh any of the potential negatives uh, and achieve something beneficial and hopefully so it's a high watermark for the rest of our colleagues who are going to follow behind us. Yes, Councilman Marvey. So are you suggesting we do, um, as was suggested by the city attorney, and make a modification to um, 0820060A? Yes, as described, I think that would be acceptable. Shall use including straws, I believe was the terminology that you had suggested. I'm sorry, as I understood the suggestion, you would introduce it with that change made, direct the city manager to do some additional outreach to the business community about the fact that the council um, uh, included straws, specifically included straws, and, and ask for their feedback. And then once that's done, bring it back to you and, and you can make a final decision. At that time, if you wanted to remove that provision, you could, you could strike it, reintroduce the ordinance, and bring it back for final adoption on a later date. And I would just emphasize um, the removal of plastic straws. Yeah. I just want that word in there, too. And I might ask, since Zero Waste Sonoma seems very thumbs up in this, they may be able to help the city manager so it's not one extra job on staff's lap completely. If there's some help with that outreach, I think that could be just great and beneficial for everybody. Um, so just one, so one more thing just to make sure I'm clear on this. Um, so like on packet page 75 is the outreach materials that Zero Waste Sonoma puts together. Um, so like in the middle of that page, it has a list of things um, by customer request only, right? So what we're talking about is taking the single use straws out of this. So we'd have like a Katati, well, if no one else follows us, we'd have a Katati version that has no straws, right. but the other things would be by request only, right? Right. That's what we're proposing. Okay. And it would be single-use plastic straws because we could have yeah. compostable, uh, whatever these dreaded huge uh, ankle-thick uh, paper straws must look like. I don't know, but I, I, I would think that met the interests of what we're all trying to do here. Yeah. So we're not totally eliminating straws, just plastic straws. Even even by request, we're not handing those out. Right. But I think you're suggesting changing that page to take the straws off of that page. Mm -hmm. Right, there would be, I mean, there would, yeah, it's implied that, as Councilmember Lamman said, it's implied that they're plastic. So right. they, they just, it would just it fall would under the general go, definition right. of a disposable food service where that is. If you just add compostable in there between single use and straws, you've got it. Because that way, if you need a straw, or there's some product where you really need that, you can, we can use that. That's good, but okay. we probably don't want to be tossing those out all the time anyhow if somebody doesn't really want to use them. All right, oh. Council Member Moore, did you, or, sorry, Vice Mayor, did it again, John. Vice Mayor Moore. No, I would be fine with it as, a, as amended in that regard. So the, the amendments, going back to packet page 97, under 08.20.060, uh, under A, all food providers utilizing any disposable food serviceware shall use, comma, including straw, um, oh, sorry, including straws shall use when products are commercially available, compostable product, right? So it's including straws after where before shall. Um, and under part D there, all food service providers shall only provide lids, cutlery, cutlery, cut, 
Cutlery. Cutlery. Thank you. And to-go condiment packages upon request. The straws will be stricken there as well. Do we do we strike straws, or does it become compostable or compostable straws? Well, I think it gets a little bit more confusing because the things that are on, that they're trying um, to talk about on, if you look at that page seventy five, is those are kind of things that ultimately you kind of want to go away, and I, I don't think you're suggesting that we get rid of compostable straws. We're just allowing them. Tempor or the straws we're allowing permanently, these things, when there becomes a compostable lid, I'm sure that what we're going to do is, you know, we'll kind of move those off of here too. These are just as a way of temporary, we're allowing these things to happen. Um, so I think it's confusing if you leave straws on there because we have another solution for straws just like we have another solution for the clamshells. It's the compostable clamshell. Okay. So I think it works either way. Okay. I would be satisfied to do it myself. I, I, I just want to make a quick comment about, I think, I think there's a two different policy intentions. One is the, the item A deals with banning straws altogether. You can't use them at all. Um, item D deals with customers having to request them so you could have you could have you could prohibit plastic straws and then also not allow businesses to give people paper straws unless they ask for them so i don't think it's necessary that you delete straws from item d it's really a policy question for the council to consider okay just it, so long I, as you don't think that people will think that means plastic straw on d Unless Which goes we, back to why I thought we should just toss it in compostable slash paper. Um, well, and I think part of that, too, will be part of the education outreach for the next year. Get it in writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Am I, are we ready for direction from yes, council? Yes, I would or? like to make a motion on that, if I may. We... We already closed public comment, unfortunately, but you want to, if you want. Okay, sure. Yeah, we can reopen public mm -hmm. comment and then see if anybody else wants to follow up with what we're talking about. So we'll reopen public, public comment. Come on up. Sorry, I was doing some research while you guys were talking. Christopher Craigmore. It seems that the state of California banned plastic straws starting in 2019 at sit down restaurants. So it's uh, this, the, the policy is written just like they have it in there where they can ask for them. But the overall use of plastic straws was banned. Just FYI already, I just don't know how it triples down to this wow. policy. Okay, so. no, thank you for yeah. doing that quick research for us. Okay, any other public comment? All right, I'll close public comment again and bring it back to council. Well, uh, almost regardless of if there's existing laws that are, you know, county or state, I still think it's fine to emphasize it here so it's clear. I mean, I don't know from a, a legal standpoint, I don't, I don't think there's a problem with doing that. So I think the direction that we have finally gelled towards, that would be, uh, that would be fine to still do. Okay, if there's no further uh, comment, I'd like to introduce uh, the ordinance. Um, the City Council of City of Katani int introduced a proposed model ordinance as amended, uh, eliminating non-compostable and non-recyclable food service ware and products containing polystyrene foam and authorized by motion the City Manager to execute an attached form agreement with Sonoma County Waste Management Authority for education and outreach in a final form approved by the city attorney. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Can we have further discussion? Aye. Sorry? No. One, one, <coughs> before we kind of, I was going to say it's too late. I wanted to make one more point to this zero waste Sonoma, but I'll make it aye. I'll make it now that we've all voted. <laughs> okay. Guys are too dang fast. Um, if you could communicate what transpired here tonight with the other cities, especially the three that have already adopted the model ordinance, 
and maybe they can start the wheels in motion, and then the other ones who haven't done it yet, they can be thinking about this as they bring it forward to their councils. Okay, so we have a, any nay votes, any abstentions? Okay, we have an official 5-0 vote in favor, and we'll move on to item 11. I tell you, okay. So item 11, adoption of amended Sonoma County Public Safety Consortium Joint Powers Agreement, yay JPAs. And for that, I think we're turning to City Manager Damien Obed. Uh, thank you. Um, as you announced, this is what we uh, we all love as the uh, SCPSC, um, the Sonoma County Public Safety Consortium. So um, this Joint Powers Authority was formed in 2008, and it was the result of um, several years before that, the Poly Class incident, and um, as you probably all remember, they, uh, uh, was it Richard Allen Davis, I think was the the guy that was ultimately convicted for that crime. He was stopped by sheriff's deputies, but they didn't know that he, had, he was wanted in a different jurisdiction in Sonoma County um, because this, the communication systems didn't speak to each other back then. So um, one, of the, one of the outcomes from that was, um, was that, like, we all need to get together and work off the same platform so that when, um, when things happen in one jurisdiction, other jurisdictions have access to the information in real time. So um, from that, after a couple iterations, um, was born the Sonoma County Public Safety Consortium. And um, their primary duty is to um, provide computer-aided dispatch, which is the computer system that dispatchers use to receive calls and dispatch um, police or fire units. The records management system, which is sort of the database in the back end that holds all the records. And then the mobile data, data computers. These are the uh, computers that are, um, that are mounted in police vehicles as well as fire engines, and they're connected via cellular technology. And um, this has been the focus of the GAPA up until now. Back in September of 2017, um, there was a strategic planning meeting held um, with, the, with all the members of the GAPA and um, you know, there was a general consensus that um, um, that there was a lot of new technologies coming down the road that were evolving kind of how public safety agencies do their job. And it would be good to have a JPA that um, could be forward-looking and not just kind of dealing with the day-to-day -day sort of um, issues that the JPA had been dealing with previously. So um, fast forward to April two, 2019, um, there was a second strategic planning meeting where they, um, among other things, they decided that um, that an executive director was needed. So before this, it was just a contracted executive director. This, this was, the decision was made that really we need to get a, like a real executive director, someone that has ownership in this project and can help not only um, evolve the agency with new technologies as things become available and they're, they're of mutual interest to the members of the JPA, but also um, uh, look to bring in other cities and sort of expand the network within the JPA. As I as, as mentioned in the staff report, um, most of the cities and um, higher education institutions are part of this JPA. There's a couple, there's three cities that are not part currently, but otherwise the rest are. So that was one of the goals was to um, was to get all the cities into the JPA so that we have a uniform public safety platform across the county. In addition, um, the JPA, as, as it was previously structured, was very um, was very cumbersome. So uh, there was a lot of a lot of committees. There's committees for everything, and so as a result, um, the administrator of the JPA spent um, his or her time basically managing various committees and not actually having any time to do anything forward-looking. So um, that was the other sort of major direction that came out of strategic planning. So the GAPA went forward. They hired the executive director. Um, Brett Sackett is his name. He's actually um, ex-Sonoma County Sheriff. He was the uh, chief for the town of Sonoma until he retired, but he's now um, a part-time administrator for the JPA. There's also um, another person is a part-time uh, staff to him um, 
pre, uh, prior um, executive director of the agency, but also before that in her working life was um, the manager for the Sonoma, for the county um, sheriff's um, dispatch center. So um, two very qualified people that are very knowledgeable in public safety. The new, um, so once they were hired, they, um, they assessed all the different needs of the agencies and, um, and that's how the GAPA kind of reached its form that is in this packet today. Um, the basic structure is that, um, you know, right now everyone that's a member, um, so like for example, when, when, um, when we joined dispatch with Sonoma State University, um, the city of Katati took the lead on getting them into the consortium and becoming full members, which required a GAPA amendment. It's kind of a big deal. Um, and the, the changes here would be that as we bring in other entities into the GAPA, it's just by resolution of the governing body, so it's more straightforward. It's easier without having to go back to every member and get it all amended for every new member that comes in. So it streamlines that to be able to bring in, hopefully, the other cities in Sonoma County. It also, um, it also protects um, all of the cities in the county, so they all maintain a seat on the board. The, um, the uh, public safety and other sort of affiliate agencies just get rotating seats as alternate directors, but it's all one seat, one vote for each member. So that typical GAPA conundrum was solved early that, look, we're all the same here. That's good. And um, like I mentioned earlier, um, the GAPA also consolidates a lot, of the, um, a lot of the various committees that were in the prior structure and makes them essentially staff committees to advise the executive director. Um, previously, they're all, um, you know, it was all minutia stuff that were individually brown acted meetings, and it was um, very difficult to manage that. So, how it works, how it's proposed to work now is there would be, um, they're, like, they're like technical staff meetings, and they would come up with proposals, and then they'd move up to a policy committee, which is the board of directors, which is um, representatives. It'd either be the man city manager or um, an appointed alternate from each city. And, um, and that would be, of course, Brown Act and Brown Act meeting and available to the public if they were interested in what was going on there. And um, the other thing it does is um, uh, it, it establishes the um, purchasing authority of the executive director of the, of the um, administrator. And then lastly, I will say that there's also bylaws attached. These are sort of draft bylaws. They're not for consideration by the city council or any of the, any of the councils that are considering this. It's really just for reference so you understand how they would work together generally. And um, that's something that ultimately would be revised and approved by the board of directors. The, the plan is to hopefully get this approved by all the various um, members of the JPA by March 1, which is the date that you see in the draft JPA agreement. And um, that is kind of it in a nutshell. I'd be happy to answer any questions about it. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for staff? Yes, Councilman Lemon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just one quick question. I, I think the amendments to the JPA all seem fine and logical to me. I just wondered if you could take us through a slightly deeper dive into how the costs play out. You mentioned on packet page 103 in the last next to last paragraph under financial considerations our participation the JP costs the city roughly 105,000 per year uh, I look at that's almost nine times what we pay for SETA and RCVA combined but then again I'm also recognizing we're maintaining a communication system and equipment and a record system at the same time, though, I know that this is maintenance at this point now, other than occasional upgrades. So if you could just give me an idea of how these costs play out, any comparisons to let me know this is not unusual, because it, it just jumped out. Because now all I'm going to hear from the staff at SETA RCPA is they need to charge us all more. So I have to have a comeback for that. Yeah, so um, like the chief was saying, so the basic, um, the basic cost structure is, um, so I'll get to costs and I'll get to how it's allocated. So in terms of costs, um, the operational, this is as an example, for 2021, the proposed budget is 3.1 million. 
for the JPA. And um, this is uh, this is operational costs. And then on top of that, there's also a replacement fund. And the replacement fund costs, um, the expenditures in 2021 is 1. 5 million essentially. And so replacements are, you know, there's a centralized, um, there's a bunch of centralized data lines, centralized servers um, that serve all of the members. And then um, it also includes things like, you know, air cards, the computers in the cars, um, the compu like the CAD computers at dispatch stations. So like the, the, the hardware itself that's in the agencies. So they're all set up and configured and then managed centrally. So there's a replacement piece of it, and then there's an operational piece. And um, in terms of the allocation, so it's allocated based on um, the total number of calls for service and um, iLeads uh, hits. So iLeads is the report writing part of the, um, of the system. So for example, every, um, every cop, whenever they have um, some incident, they write a report on it. And I think it also includes um, other hits, like if you're in your car and you're out um, responding to a call, you have an iLeads sort of um, hit on the system. And um, it's really just sort of a, I kind of look at it as a surrogate of activity, you know, like how active different agencies are. So that's a, con a combined, you know, iLeads and calls for service. And what they do is, um, and, and, the, and this JPA has been through various iterations of cost allocation methodologies. This is the one that has been in place for the last couple of years, and it's a five-year rolling average. So you take five years of data and they at average it. And um, then they add up the, the iLeads hits and the calls for service by agency, and then that's how those total numbers I mentioned earlier get allocated by agency. So um, 100,000 is certainly not cheap, um, but that's just how it comes out for us. Good. Okay. Well, certainly having a cost that's based in usage is a good grounding for JPA costs. It's nice to see a JPA where you have something that good a foundation to point to, and I appreciate the differentiation between the operational costs being roughly two-thirds and the replacements being roughly a third. So that's, I think, what I needed to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Well, any questions for Vice Mayor? Okay. Any questions for staff on the site? Yes, Councilor Delosa. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, do you have any idea as to why there's four cities missing? Cloverdale, Sebastopol, Healdsburg, Santa Rosa. Any reason why they're not a part of this? Yeah, yeah Santa Rosa's in. It's um, Sebastopol, Cloverdale, and Healdsburg. Okay, I missed Santa Rosa on the list somehow. Yeah. Okay, any, again. Yeah, they didn't join. So I get that. That's pretty clear. Yeah. Um, is, are they? thinking of joining? Do you have any kind of intel on that? I'm just kind of curious why aren't all the cities on board? Because you have these other, you know, educational entities and the county. Yeah, they, um, I, you know, in the past, uh, like Cloverdale was part of the project when it was first starting, mm -hmm. and then they dropped out um, before it actually formed, before the JPA formed, but they were in the initial part of the formation. Um, Healdsburg had talked about it at some point, but then they didn't. Um, Sebastopol, I don't know. Yeah, but that's all right. But I mean, it's definitely it's definitely a goal. I mean, it was definitely a stated goal of the JPA to really get everyone into the same system, so they're not operating with different systems out there. Right. That don't talk to each other. Right. Yeah. It's just interesting that they're not. They're, yeah. Okay. Especially those right on the 101 corridor. But anyway, thank you. Could be a good job for the new executive officer. <laughs> Any questions, Councilor Barbie? Yes. So um, given that um, this JPA is, you know, going through, as it stated, a new board structure and staffing model and a lot of the committees, one that kind of jumps out at me that's being eliminated is oversight committee um, and, advise, and management advisory group. It strikes me um, that uh, no um, approval of items up to a hundred thousand dollars is is a lot. I mean, typically, um, an executive director has to come before the board um, for items, you know, in the above the twenty-five thousand dollar range. This just seems like a um, 
large number, especially since it's kind of a new structure or an evolving structure and a lot of the input that maybe the director would have gotten before, that isn't going to happen. So can you speak to that? It just kind of jumped out at me. Yeah, so um, on your second question first, on the um, purchasing authority of the, um, of the executive director. So this is, um, looking through the packet, this is in the bylaws, correct? We're talking about, like on packet page 120. Well, this is the amended version, the 123. 103, it talks about. 103. Uh, I think that's the staff report. The staff, oh, the, the staff report, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so where that's where that's described in the in these um, documents is in the um, in the attached bylaws. Yeah. And um, what it um, what it says is the chair of the board of directors and the purchasing agent are authorized. So, um, the uh, intent I think there was, we, you know, honestly, we didn't have a very long discussion about it since the bylaws weren't. Um, they're going to come back to the full board for further discussion and then revision and amendment and potential adoption. Um, but the way it's written right now is the chair of the board of directors and the purchasing agent, which is the executive director, would have to basically co-sign on expenditures. And this is like on packet page, say like 123? Right, right. Yeah. That's that's how it's written right now. Um, if there's discomfort in that, I'd be, I mean, I'd I, I do acknowledge that $100,000 is a relatively high threshold um, for a smaller agency, for sure. Um, I think what they were trying to do to give some level of comfort with that was have the chair of the board of directors also have to co-sign those things. But if, that being said, if there's discomfort with that, yeah. I'd be happy to take that back. I mean, because if you read that, that whole sentence, it says the chair of the board of directors and the purchasing agent are authorized to sign payment requests and related contracts on behalf of the SCPSC with or without direct board approval mm -hmm. right. um, if they fall within the budget. Um, it definitely can be read two different ways. It can be read two different yeah. ways. It almost sounds like either of them can, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't mm -hmm. really say that they both must sign. It just kind of says they both have signing authority up to 100,000. That just makes me uncomfortable. Um, and it may not make anyone else uncomfortable. It just makes me uncomfortable. Mayor, I can um, maybe help here a little bit. This, this provision is in the bylaws. So what you're being asked to do tonight is sign on to the JPA. And you could do that and then indicate, send a message to the JPA board or your representative to, to not approve, uh, to have the bylaws revised, because ultimately the bylaws are going to be adopted by the JPA board. They're their internal rules, not, not the, the JPA is the uh, agreement you all sign off on. Correct. Then, you know, I just think that it's worth a discussion. I don't know that it sounds like there was a discussion about that. That just seems, in comparison to a lot of the JPAs, that seems kind of high to me. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely understand the point, and I'd be happy to yeah. take that discussion further with them on the bylaws. Yeah, if it brings any comfort, because um, this kind of mirrors the discussions we started out with the JPA, Sonoma Clean Power as a JPA initially, of what the signing authority would be for the chair. And that's something that's grown over the years to get rather high, too. But if you take a look, although there's some, certainly some difference in the level of revenues you might be receiving each year, if you look at the size of the things they're purchasing, we're touching in general, large systems of maintenance, uh, big computer packages for multiple cities, there's probably a reason that number's probably more in the ballpark than I think we guessed just looking at it. Speaking as the guy that asked him why we're paying 100K a year, just, just wanting to hear that. But I, I can see that. So we're talking buying for multiple cities. And ultimately, this, the bylaws are, will be the business of this board of directors, which I think will be, I think you're going to have more oversight with an active board of directors, frankly, than just advisory and oversight committees. So I think you're stepping up in terms of true oversight uh, and co-management of that. So 
And I do agree, I think we could support this tonight and give direction to our potential representative who might just be sitting here right in the room from what I read in this and ask for him to take a good look at that and make sure that seems appropriate for that organization with the typical purchases they make and, and if not to bring that point forward. I would be comfortable with that. It just, you know, I, I want to be sure that the discussion is had by the board because, um, you know, oftentimes, especially um, as you pointed out, these bylaws have been around for a while, but the structure of what's going on has changed. So, you know, oftentimes the two don't necessarily go together and sometimes you have to review some of that stuff based upon changes in the structure. Yeah, and I'd be happy to bring that discussion back to the board. Yeah, um, and on your earlier question about the oversight committee, um, the you know the issue um, the issue there was that the uh, there was a lot of discussion in the formation in the in the reformation of the board that we're talking about tonight about having to making sure that there's city manager representation in this board um, as a policy committee. I think historically what had happened is um, it was getting delegated to other folks and so people in the oversight or the or the you know mag group which is below that or the joe ag were they were shuffling up into different positions and it just got muddled and so the intent isn't really to get rid of the sort of the function of it but to you know um but to you know keep that advisory function there but make it clear who's a board of director and what kind of, um, that you have chiefs and you have, you know, like chief or fire, police or fire chiefs and you have city managers, so you have a combined group on the board. And then below that you have other, like, you know, lieutenants and other, you know, kind of high ranking sort of staff within the public safety agencies that can um, make these sort of advisory oversight kind of recommendations based on yet another layer of advisory groups below them that are technical groups. Right, so it goes through several layers, but it it just clarifies that because it was getting um, there were so many different committees and not enough people, frankly, to fill them all that they were getting muddled. So that was the intent. That's fine. Any more questions for staff at this point? Or are we good? Okay, so I'll open it up to public comment. Does anybody want to comment on this? All right, seeing none, I'll close public comment and we'll bring it back to the council. I'd like to make a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute the amended Sonoma County Public Safety Consortium Joint Powers Agreement. Boy, that's a, that's a mouthful. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nay, any abstention? Okay, we'll show that's and, a final uh, we, just, we are covered that uh, the city manager understands bringing the discussion back about that power of purchasing <laughs> okay to see a nod yes Perfect. yes I understand I will bring it back to the board okay great thank you so now we'll move on to item 11 B discontinuation of residential water service policy to comply with SB 998 and for that I will I think turn again to I'm Angela Andrew. tonight you yes. are Angela okay um, all right so uh, we had talked um, we had a presentation in the last year about SB 998. So this is a piece of state legislation which went into effect, um, and it's requiring, as um, the name implies, a discontinuation of residential water service policy. And um, basically what this does is it provides additional rules and procedures for residential water service, um, like when, it, when residential water service can be interrupted and is intended to minimize the number of um, customers who have their water service interrupted due to their inability to pay. Um, presumably, this legislation was introduced at the state level because um, some utilities in the state were cutting off people that couldn't, you know, like um, that didn't make their payment on time or, or whatever the case might be. Um, so, as we went through drafting this policy, I'll just say before I get into some of the details of it, um, a lot of the policy elements that are required under this new law are things that we already do or we go beyond anyway, already. Um, I guess there's a community somewhere that doesn't, th thus the law. <laughs> but um, with that said, the one thing we don't do is, um, we, is we don't provide a policy in Spanish, Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, Korean, and any other language spoken by 10% of the population. So that is one change we have to make. 
Um, I guess, you know, some urban areas have those demographics, um, particularly, you know, some of those um, uh, demographics such as um, Filipino and Vietnamese. But anyway, that's a standard requirement across the state, regardless of which part of the state you're in. So we'd be translating our policy into all those different languages. And um, the policy would have to contain payment options for a plan for deferred or reduced payments and alternative payment schedules, uh, formal appeal a process for disputing bills, and of course telephone numbers, um, which we already, we already do um, most of that already. And um, the main thing it would do is it would, um, it would further extend um, some periods for payment prior to disconnection. Um, we already have a pretty lengthy period. This would make it even longer. Um, there's various noticing requirements, and um, with respect to um, alternative payment arrangements, the customer would have to provide certification from a primary care provider um, and, and, um, and or demonstrate a, that they're financially unable to pay and that they're willing to enter into a payment arrangement. And the, um, if you, in the policy itself, it talks about what that means. So what, what does unable to pay mean? How do you demonstrate that? Um, and a payment plan would be a 12-month, uh, could be up to, um, or would be a 12-month repayment plan for outstanding balances for customers that fall into those categories and request it. Um, they would only be able to get into one payment plan at a time. That was a question that came up last time when we did the presentation. Would it be like every billing cycle, would there be another payment plan? That's not the case. You'd have a single, if you can't make a payment on a billing cycle, you could go into a payment plan. And then that payment plan would be the only payment plan they could get into until it's paid off. And then they could get into another payment plan, assuming they qualify under one of these criteria. Um, it would allow tenants of multifamily properties, um, either served by a single or um, uh, single meter systems or um, collective, you know, um, meter systems, that they could, um, if they're, like let's say you live in an apartment building and your landlord decides they want to stop paying the water bill. Um, rather than allowing sort of a uh, deadbeat landlord to have everyone get cut off in that complex, um, the residents in the complex have the option of taking the bill over so that water service is um, not interrupted. Of course, that creates a situation with the, the tenants and the landlord to try to recover those costs, but the basic, the basic issue here is that water, would, water service would continue and it wouldn't be shut off because of a landlord. And um, then there would also be reporting requirements. So we'd have to report um, the annual number of service interruptions for non-payment on the city's website, and we have to report it to the State Water Resources Control Board. So um, uh, that would take, you know, it take a little bit more time, staff time to do that, but we already have, you know, I don't know, two dozen things we already report. So it's one more thing. And I don't, I don't think it'd be that big of a deal because we could set up our systems to track those. And um, this policy would have to, under the law, would have to go into effect by February 1 of this year. So it's coming right up here. And there would have to be some additional changes to our ordinances around um, some elements of it that we'll bring back at a future meeting. And like I mentioned earlier, the main, the main fiscal impact to the city would be that, um, that the, it lengthens the amount of delinquency, the delinquency period that can go out longer. It also um, could delay repayment for up to 12 months for some accounts. But um, that, um, that's really it in a nutshell. And I'd be happy to get into the details of the, order, of the policy if you have any questions. Okay, do we have any questions for staff at this point? Yes, Councilmember DeLasso, you're nodding. I'm just really confused. Um, <laughs> So, Me too. so let's say somebody requests a 12-month payment plan. So that means by the end of the 12th month, they would have had to pay some previous amount. Okay, so far I'm, I'm on board with that. But then in the ongoing 12 months up to that date, they're incurring more costs. So. This, this is where I was just, I'm trying to follow like a matrix and I had lines going all over the place and I said, I'm just going to ask the question. So I'm just losing, I, I get the fact that, you know, if there's people that can't make a payment for whatever reason, it's probably 
not a continuous thing. It's probably some infrequent blip in their financial scheme. At least that's kind of what I'm hoping. Um, but is there not a scenario where somebody could have a payment plan that goes for 12 months, and by the time they get to the end of that 12 months and they've paid off some previous debt, they've incurred more? Help me. Yeah, so um, the, way, the way it works, or is proposed to work, is that let's say you have a billing cycle where you can't make the payment or you can't make the full payment or whatever the case might be. So then you can, if you meet one of those criteria to go into a payment plan, then you can contact the city. Um, there's criteria about when they're supposed to contact the city. They're not supposed to wait until they get disconnected or something. You know, right. they, they contact the city. Um, and then the city can um, put them on a payment plan for, say, 12 months. So, so that payment plan then is set and it's running, right, for 12 months. The next billing cycle comes along and they get another bill. They need to pay that bill. They can't not pay that bill. And then why'd they get on the payment plan? This is where I get confused. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just getting a little bit confused with this. And it, you know, it, I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about the, the amount of income that will still come into the city will be the same. It'll just be scattered. That's probably not too big of a deal. But I'm just, you know, I'm just really, you can tell I'm really confused yeah, by well, this, this option here. Yeah, I think um, it, it's state legislation. I don't know. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think, I, I th <laughs> That's always we're, we're dealing with, with housing issues too. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I understand. It, but I think, I think the intent is if someone has a, an issue one month and they, and they can't, like, come up with it the next month or the next billing cycle, Right, it gives them sort of a, a way to finance that one cycle. But if, but I think the, the thought behind it is that if you were able to finance every single cycle, then you would essentially kind of continuously be. Right, that was my concern. And I, yeah. and I don't know that that's very realistic. And I think what's more realistic is somebody who uh, in one period of time can't pay that bill completely off. And so they need some more time. And I'm kind of just hoping that's where it's going to end. Yeah, so, so, so here's a scenario, right? I, so maybe like someone has a job interruption, right? And they don't have the money in one billing cycle. And so they can finance that out. Right. And then presumably by the next time, the time the next billing cycle rolls around, they're, you know, they're able to pay that bill, but they still have a little bit more they pay from the prior bill and they pay it over 12 months. You know, otherwise, it would be just continuous and you'd never, it would be like paying your minimum balance on your credit card and you'd never. Right be out of debt. So it, I think that's the intent. Okay. That's and that's how it's structured. That's how the state law and that's how the policy is structured. And that sort of helped me, but it didn't help me. But thank you. I appreciate right. it. Well, and I was thinking of, say, I just picked a random number because it was easily divided by 12. Um, say you have $60 and you can't pay it that much month, then I'm, what I'm guessing is that you would take that in the next 11 months and you would tack on $6 and then it would get paid off by the time you got to the end of the year and then you would start back if that makes any sense you're spreading out the payment the, ma the math makes perfect sense well if, if you think about it if, if you run into a situation where you're temporarily short and can't make a payment you might be able to pay on, under normal times when you get your feet back you might be able to handle a higher bill than your typical water bill but you might not be able to handle two at once for that situation the idea is you can use this as a tool to smooth that over a period of time and i bet you don't have to go the full year if you don't need to or want to but i think it allows that so that means that and this is i, I think as you've adroitly pointed out this is designed for people that are able to do this but they're just like happens to everybody there's rough times occasionally they get behind and this is to help them bridge that so then they can continue. Uh, it's not designed for ongoing inability to afford. That, that's a completely separate and more difficult problem. So, so I hope that helps because it seems, it's confusing, but it seems clear. It's just, it's a smoothing tool like they do with the water agency, you know, with, with the budget. Yeah, I, and maybe I didn't say, maybe I wasn't that clear, but I think that is, I think that is the intent is that in month, let's say billing cycle or month two, let's say you have a second month and you get another $60 bill, you don't have to then pay $120. You can pay, you know, 60 plus whatever that financed amount is from the prior. And, and, and the hope is that that makes it more manageable for somebody. Um, the state law does require that we offer them a 12-month period at least. For that one. For that one, yes. 
So, um, but as Councilmember Lamman had alluded to, the customer could voluntarily just pay it all off the next month if they, if they desired. We know there's no penalty for that, but we would be required to at least allow them 12 months to repay it. Yes, Councilman Robert. I guess the whole problem that I'm having with this is it, it, it's billed as a um, don't turn off people's water um, for their non-ability to pay. And that non-ability to pay, it seems to me, is just not going to be in this short little, oh, I only have this 30 days and I'm not going to be able, I mean, it seems to me that it's a likely to be a bigger issue than just this small little um, $60 bill. I mean, I just feel like the next month, if it's 60 again, that one's going to be a problem too. I just don't think magic will occur. Um, so the way the whole way this thing is written um, just seems a little bit odd to me because I, I think the intent um, on the face says we don't want people who can't afford not to have water, yet the way it's described here, it's like, well, we don't want that to happen for just one month and we'll let you spread it out for 12 months. So it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense and I'm very confused too. Yeah, well, so one I'll say that I guess we'll, you know, um, as the state law goes into effect, we'll kind of see how it works in practice. Um, but definitely, I mean, the intent wasn't to, because even if you can't afford a month, let's say a billing cycle, if you keep on financing every one of them, I mean, it's like a never-ending mountain that keeps on getting bigger. Exactly. So, so I don't think that was the intent. Just declare bankruptcy. Just, just I, I was looking at the statute, and as, as I understand it, once you're in a payment program, if you've gone delinquent, you have to pay your current charges uh, within 60 days or the city can terminate service. So, so, so I think that answers the question you had. You can't just keep refinancing your, your charges as they come due. If you're already in a plan, then you have to pay your bill or you can have your service terminated. And you have to pay that bill in full. The current, the, the the current bill the needs to be paid current, in full yes. or the city can terminate service, but it has to wait 60 days. Right. If I, may, if I may, I think the maximum exposure is going to be 120 days if they can't pay it. You need the finance plan I for the 60 days. I think that's right, as long as the city can. stays on top of right. the, right. Um, because you have two 60-day periods. Right. I think that's right. So that's the maximum exposure there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends on the billing cycle, too, but yeah, right. And, then, and then, I'm sorry, if I may, we need to also adopt this by February? The policy. The policy. Yeah. Before February. And then I just, did you have any questions? And then the only question I wanted to ask, clarify was we're also going to be switching to monthly because then that will be making it less cumbersome than people who are paying. Because before we were every other month, correct? We are currently every other month, yeah. We, um, we weren't going to make that, we were probably going to, um, make that change with the ordinance revisions that we come back with. So it wouldn't be as part of this policy, we wouldn't be making that billing cycle change, but it would follow on shortly. So yeah. probably in the late spring or summer is when that would so, happen. Okay. So does that complicate the implementation of this or does it just make the amount be no. bigger? It, 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 it doesn't. Halved, your, amount get, your bill gets halved because now you're getting monthly instead of every two months. Yeah. No, yeah. right, but we're not doing that, which is what you asked. We're not doing that right now. We're going to do that later. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah. It. I, I mean, it really just the main implication of that is that um, is that people could have larger delinquent bills because it's a, a two month period instead of a one month. Right. If if this were to be applied in the interim before the actual um, monthly cycles in place, monthly billing cycles in place. But to John's point on what our exposure is until we move to monthly, that set because we're bi monthly that second bill is got another 60 days yes. on it too That's so right. it actually is yeah, yeah. i mean from a city exactly. from a city perspective yeah. it does lengthen the amount of time our um, exposure yeah our exposure yeah. Yeah. okay so but I, I think that's a very transitional 
issue. I don't, I don't expect it to be a very major thing as we're switching okay. through the spring. So any more questions? Or are we good for the moment? OK. So I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. So yes, Mr. Parrish. Well, I'm not going to be as politically correct here. This is the dumbest thing I've seen come before the city council in a long time. Now, this does not prohibit you from adopting this uh, and following the state guideline and going one step further. You can come up, the city can come up with its own financial uh, plan to help in that second or third month. You can develop a fund, a safety fund, an emergency fund. Um, I think you can have your cake and eat it too, in the sense that you can go beyond and do something uh, more creative. There's millions of dollars in the water and sewer fund. You got millions of dollars apparently from Measure G. We have a very small fraction of people who are delinquent on their water bills. I think this is a no-brainer. I think this council can figure out a way uh, to uh, chew gum and walk at the same time here and solve a very old problem. For many, many years going back, we citizens complained that the city was very, very quick to turn off the water for a dumb monthly delinquent bill or two months delinquent, shutting off the, the water to people's homes with children in the homes with elderly in the homes, a health and safety issue, turning off water for a measly $100 or $200 bill. It was, it was crazy. It went on for years. And there were a few people who skipped out of town, not paying their water bill. I don't know what the legal procedure is to lien the property. If there's an outstanding water bill, we haven't talked about that. I mean, there's other solutions here, but the, just the very thought the, um, of turning off people's water. I mean, how cruel, how much more cruel can it get? Um, you're, you know, you're smart people. You should be able to get through this, despite the state of California. Um, this is a loving community, and it's been a, a scar, a stain on this town for so many years, turning off people's water, their lifeblood. Um, somehow we've swept, swept it under the rug. Uh, we've left it to the bureaucrats in the other office to do it and get public works to turn it off. Boy, it's, it's, it's been shameful, and I, and I, I want to support you you folks in doing better to step up your game and find a real solution on how we can either finance this ourselves, uh, put together some kind of charity, uh, do, a, do a charity drive, so there's a pool of money for people who are suffering like this who can't pay their water bill. All right, thank you for your comments. Anybody else on this topic? All right, seeing none, I'll close public comment and bring it back to council. If there's no further discussion, I'd like to move adoption of a resolution to approve the discontinuation of the residential water service policy. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Any abstention? Okay, please show that's a 5-0 vote in favor. And we'll move on to item 11C, uh, receiving and filing the Measure G annual report. For that, I'm also turning to Angela slash Damien. Yes. Okay. I'll try to keep my voice a little higher. Um, so uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. This is um, the Measure G annual report, as you just said. So um, this is for fiscal year 1819, which is the year that we had just finished at the last council meeting. The council had received the um, CAFR, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. So um, that's the prerequisite to um, the Measure G report to make sure all the Finances from the fiscal year are audited um, by independent auditor and closed. And um, as we talked about with the CAFR, um, the, we got a clean opinion. So there was no findings. Everything was um, basically in audit language. That means everything was properly accounted for and all the business processes are in place to make sure that things are accounted for the way they should be accounted for. 
And um, following the uh, completion of the CAFR, the Measure G Oversight Committee um, heard the Measure G report. Um, this was on January 16th, so just a couple weeks ago. And um, I'll just flip through this real quick. It's the highlights of it. So, um, so Measure G, um, as you know, uh, it's, it's, it's for essential city services, um, including public safety, street, sidewalk, storm drains, park and landscape, public building, recreation. Those are the, the broad categories that um, Measure G funding is used for. Um, I mentioned the audited financial report, which um, was completed recently and accepted by the council. And, um, and just some background information on Measure G. So this is, um, this is the sales tax breakdown of, um, in Katati. So statewide sales tax and use is uh, seven and a quarter. There is um, uh, one percent local Bradley Burns tax that um, that um, that goes to the city. That's part of the blue pie, and then the county add add-on. If you look on the uh, right, there's a county add-on taxes. So that's smart open space, SCTA. This is roads measure M, the county library measure Y, and parks measure M. Um, all that adds up to 1%. That's the green wedge there. And then Measure G is the, um, the rust-colored wedge. So in fiscal year 1819, um, Measure G accounted for $2.6 million. And um, there was a minor amount that goes to the state for administration of the tax. Um, and that's a quarterly breakdown. So the growth um, was primarily in um, food and drugs and restaurants in fiscal year 1819. So this is um, a breakdown by type. So um, in the report that's included in the, in the council packet, it's broken into operations and maintenance as well as improvement projects and equipment. So operations and maintenance is, um, is blue, improvement projects and equipment is green. So generally speaking, um, the operations and maintenance hovers around uh, two thirds of the Measure G revenue. That's or two thirds of the Measure G expenditures, which is the same. Um, and about a third in projects and equipment. So um, this is another way to look at that same information. This is by program type. So um, you can see by different color there, starting at uh, fiscal year 14-15, where it first went into effect, and through 18-19 at the top there. So the majority, as you can see, of um, by program type goes into public safety, primarily police. And um, that's the blue part, right? The green bars are street sidewalk and storm drain. So street maintenance, um, street repair. The, um, the rust colored segment of, that, of those bars through the years is um, parks. So enhanced park maintenance and uh, landscape maintenance and streets. And then public building um, maintenance is the kind of orange, or not orange, the uh, purplish or gray color. And then finally, at the very far right there is recreation. So um, as you can see, in uh, fiscal 8, uh, 14, 15, uh, recreation didn't exist. That was one of um, the priorities of the community and one of the priorities of the council is to bring recreation programming back to the city. So you can see in 15, 16, recreation starts up and it's been, it's been growing each fiscal year since then. So it's taking a larger um, part of the funding. Um, so for fiscal year 18, 19, that's the, that's the amount that went into that, 784000 roughly. And um, it's for ongoing funding of, the, of our local police department, replacement of, police vehicle, of a police vehicle, and um, also in the public safety category are some um, safety improvements in, on the streets. So um, the three-way traffic stop in La Plaza, that's behind the fire station, to reduce the bypass traffic between Old Red and East Katati was also in that category. Streets, sidewalk, and storm drains for fiscal year 1819, um, about 835,000. So um, continued funding for um, the civil engineer, and enhanced traffic signal, street light, and roadway landscape maintenance. Um, the first phase of the L Street um, street paving and reconstruction project and design of the second phase was included in there. That's, that amounted to about $1.5 million in street work in 1819, as you, and as you know, um, the street work bump 
was even bumped up more in, um, 19, in our current fiscal year in 1920 to 2.5 million. And then you add in the other street-related improvements, and it's um, well over 3 million in this current fiscal year. But, and this year it was 1.5 for direct street repair work. And um, for context, I will just, you know, I'll just point out that um, like the general fund um, expenditures is around, um, is around 8 million. So that's a, you know, as a proportion, that's very large um, expenditure relative to any city. And then also, um, it allows us to leverage grants. And so in this case, um, it was allowing us to leverage this East Katati Avenue paving project grants as a federal grant. Um, the grant was 675,000, which we also had to put Measure G money into um, to be able to leverage that grant. This is the, the road project between the railroad tracks and the city limits in front of Sunflower Park. It was that paving project that happened this last summer. Um, the five-year street capital plan um, moved forward, which um, you all have seen. Design of the school street pathway on Richardson. Um, again, that's a CDBG grant, but Measure G allows us to match that and, um, and get that funding source and basically bring more dollars into our community. And then um, a new stormwater, um, municipal stormwater permit requires some various things that um, this is Measure G assisted with um, studying trash impacts, which is part of that stormwater permit requirement. Park and landscape uh, for 1819, about 439,000. Um, included ongoing operations, including a full-time maintenance worker and public works. And um, it provided funding to complete the lighting project in La Plaza, as well as um, Marsh and McGinnis uh, pathways and School Street Tunnel. Um, continued um, funding the park master plan, um, which um, you all um, saw recently. And, and all this stuff is coming forward, um, I think, at the next meeting in the, in the consolidated CIP. So you'll see it, you know, see that all the different areas put together in, in one master CIP next, next meeting, I believe. And then um, removal of some um, pine trees at Sunflower that were, um, that were diseased and unsafe. And then public building um, funded ongoing um, building costs. We had to replace our HVAC system here in City Hall, which was failing, um, and various um, improvements to public facilities. Recreation for 1819. Um, again, this funded our recreation manager and recreate and facilities coordinator, um, and also funded seasonal employment for up to six part-time staff, um, camp staff, and um, counselors for the CIT program. Uh, redesigned um, and helped to pay for the redesign of the activity guide, and um, funded all services and supplies. Essentially, recreation is um, is largely funded from Measure G. And um, the auditor, like they do every year, they looked at all of the city's finances, including Measure G, and um, uh, they provided a clean audit, and it was, um, uh, it was unqualified. So everything, um, everything was properly accounted for, and all the uh, internal controls are in place to um, make sure things are properly accounted for. And that's, um, from, the, uh, that's from the CAFR, but it's the uh, Measure G audited statement that verifies the numbers spent by category. And um, the last thing I'll just point out is in the packet, there's a letter from the Measure G Oversight Committee, which basically, um, uh, basically states that the expenditures met the, uh, the intent and spirit of Measure G, in their opinion, and they're recommending, are they, um, they are uh, forwarding the Measure G report to the council, that's what the, what the action was. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about this. Okay. Thank you. So do we have any questions for staff? Okay, nothing on this side. Okay, okay. Um, then I'll open it up to public comment. Anybody? Yes, Mr. Marriage. I think it's uh, it's timely now to talk about uh, what a failure Measure G has been over the years. Uh, looking back, the gains that have been made over Measure G 
does not negate the fact how much money the city has lost by not lowering the tax rates that we had talked about when Measure G was first introduced. If you want less of something, like less business, less business uh, activity, less tourism, you're going to raise taxes. That's how you do it. It's all ec Econ 101. If you want more of something, more tourism, more sales tax dollars, more business investment coming into Katati, more development, you're going to lower the tax rates and watch what happens. It's a phenomenal multiplying effect that is known all over the world that Katati never, it never sunk in. Now, you can praise these numbers all you want, but we're never going to know the amount of revenue this city has lost, the amount of uh, city pride that has been lost, how many people have left Katati, how many jobs were lost here in Katati because of higher, higher sales tax rates, higher fees, and so forth. Yeah, you can parade out these numbers, but in reality, look around the town. Look at the undeveloped lots, undeveloped properties. Look at uh, all the, the developers who have come and gone, who looked at uh, the landscape and thought, no, not with this city council, not with this tax plan. We're close to 10% to tax. It's just been uh, a, to a total failure in that regard because the city failed to look at the basic economic models that are proven, tried, and true through history. And we missed an opportunity. We missed an opportunity to, to kill Measure G when we had the chance and watch the growth and the prosperity that would have come to Katati had we had a competitive advantage over some of the other com communities and competitive advantage over the internet and internet sales. So it's sad. It's sad for those of us who are educated in economics and business to see how we failed and how we have twisted the facts and the logic to perpetuate this hoax over the community that this actually has been a good thing for our community. All right, thank you for your comments. Anybody else want to comment on the Measure G? All right, seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the council. Seeing no further comments, I'm going to make a motion. Okay. Um, so, I will just say, I think it's a receive and file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. So there's, there's no motion needed. Okay. Um, well, it is received yeah. and filed. Thank you. I wonder if I might make a quick comment, just very quickly. Uh, sure. I just have to say, I do think we should indeed, if not parade at least, I think these numbers should be shared with the community, but they don't really need these numbers to look at. Because actually, everybody that lives here, or just about everybody that lives here, all you have to do is look around for yourself and see that, in fact, You've had your three I'm sorry, I, I listened in rapt attention when you were speaking. I'd appreciate the same respect from you. Not really, but I'd appreciate it if you could keep yourself under control. So as I just want to say briefly, I think six years in gives us a good yardstick to measure, and I think the success is pretty evident, and the benefit's certainly evident. I remember there were a few neighbors we were concerned, would a small difference, a half a cent, could this make a big difference? I hear nobody, pretty much like nobody, talking about it now, but what I do hear is people are happy with the roads, they're happy with the streets, they're happy with the police department being sound and there, they're happy with the parks, they're happy with the rec department, and I think this proves that. So I just wanted to say that and give staff a thumbs up for their work on this, because I see it a little more clearly every single year, and I know the public does too, so I hope you know that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. All right, thank you. I'll we'll move on to item 12, the city manager's report. Back to Mr. Obit. All right. I like the structure of these meetings, so I just talk the whole time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanted to uh, uh, just let everyone know that, um, and we put it out on social media and, and uh, various forums, but we received our um, third straight budget award from both the GFOA, that's the part we all know, 
but we also just heard that we also got it from the CSMFO, which um, I'll give you the acronyms. So GFOA is the Government Finance Officer Association. Um, that's the uh, North American Municipal Governmental Association that sets standards for like auditing and so forth. They set the standards for municipal finance. And then CSF, uh, CSMFO is a California Society of Municipal Finance Officers, so the, um, the California version of the GFOA. And um, uh, this award just reflects the commitment of the city council um, and the staff to meeting the highest principles of governmental budgeting and fiscal transparency. And for the third straight year, the Katati has received this award, which um, I'll point out was only received by about 1% of cities in North America with a population under 10,000. So it's, it, is, it is a big deal if, you're in, if you follow governmental financing at all. Um, in order to receive the budget award, every application is reviewed by a panel of volunteer municipal finance officers, and the city had to satisfy nationally recognized guidelines for municipal budgeting. The guidelines are designed to assess how well the city's budget serves as a policy document, a financial plan, an operations guide, and a communication device. So that's, the, that's sort of the intent of it. Anyway, so um, Angela's not here, but just good job to her um, admin services, as well as sort of the, you know, the, the policy direction that continues from the council. It's very helpful to be able to be in a position to get these kind of awards. And then um, since I'm on the uh, topic of awards, another one that I will let everyone know about tonight is um, our Explore Katati, our activity guide, also won an award. Um, so the activity guide was selected by the California Parks and Recreation Society, this is CPRS, as an award of excellence recipient for marketing and communications. The CPRS awards programs recog um, recognize, recognizing outstanding achievement in the areas of facility design, park planning, marketing and communication, and community improvement and programming through demonstra demonstrating the um, we love acronyms. So the CREAM principles, which stands for Challenge, Resourceful, Resourcefulness, Execution, Accomplishment, and Alignment with the Parks and Recreation Mission. So it's sort of the highest honor for um, in the Park and Recreations field for activity guides. Um, so I've already congratulated Ashley this afternoon. But I wanted to let everyone know. Um, so uh, moving off of awards, um, just wanted to also uh, mention that um, we're doing some special traffic enforcement in the upcoming weeks. This has also been put out on social media recently. Um, Katati police officers will be focusing on pedestrian safety, citing drivers who do not stop for citizens across walks and distracted drivers using cell phones will also be part of the focus to make Katati a safer place to walk and ride bikes. Um, so even though we'll broadcast it far and wide, people will still do it, so there will be no lack of action, I'm sure. And. Um, on Saturday, February 22nd, we're hosting our third annual Sweetheart's Fairy Tale Dance in the Katati Room, and that's from 5.30 to 8 p.m. It's a family dance for children and, and their guardians to dress up and spend the night dancing, taking photos, playing games, making crafts, and enjoying refreshments. So space is limited, so sign up early on that. We also recently started a free yoga class for older adults through the Santa Rosa JC Older Adults Program. This class is ongoing on Tuesdays from 1 to 2.30 in the Katati Room. Um, you can also sign, you can sign up for the J, sign up to the class through the JC or at the class, and we're excited to continue our partnership to offer more no-cost programming to the community's senior population. We, um, this is in addition to the existing free Zumba Gold class that's also in the Katati room um, on Wednesdays from 9.30 to 10.20 in the morning. And um, just a reminder, the Veranda Flady Ranch Building Improvements um, Project is out to bid. They're opening bids this Thursday on that. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the projects. So that's good. So we're hopeful that we'll get a, um, a good bid on that project. Uh, wayfinding uh, program is scheduled to be out to bid in early February with awards scheduled for early March. So that's moving along as well. And this would be the first, um, the, the first phase of the wayfinding program construction, but it should be a pretty substantial piece. So it'll be good to see that actually finally get out there. And then um, uh, design has been underway for over a month on the um, new sewer on William Street and Olaf Street, and also the 2020 Street Paving Project. So um, the sewer line on William and Olaf is, is um, you know, we're expecting to put that out to bid, and then, of course, that'll come to council. But on that schedule, it, it would be um, 
slated tentatively for late spring for the sewer project to go into construction. And that would be ahead of um, the uh, summer paving project. So then the 2020 paving, which is doing the ring roads, and some of you know West Sierra would follow on the heels of that so that we can get the utility work done before the paving comes through. Just construction sequencing. So um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Okay, any questions on the city manager's report? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to city council member reports. So go to my left first, council member Landman. <clears throat> Let's see, I do have one. Uh, this kind of came about by accident, so give me, I'll try and keep this brief, but give me a second to set it up. Uh, so I had been in conversation with our mutual colleague, Patrick Slater, uh, who's currently the mayor over in Sebastopol, and he was talking about his upcoming council meeting and mentioned they had an item about <clears throat> complaints in their community about noise, increased noise from the airport, and they were going to be writing a letter and delivering to the supervisors. And I mentioned that's something I'm noticing a lot in my neighborhood my area from a lot of people personally noticing it, that I had Brown acted with one colleague and they had noticed it in their neighborhood, so I think it's fair to assume that it's at least roughly half our community is impacted by a notable change. And evidently, <clears throat> credit to his supervisor, Supervisor Hopkins, she had heard of this concern and reached out and invited him up to the County of Sonoma to her offices to meet with uh, John Stout, who's the airport manager. and. Patrick mentioned to her, oh yeah, I heard, I heard from Mark Lamb that there might be concerns in Katati as well too. So she gave me a call at the last minute, or a text actually, and said, you know, we're going to meet in an hour, but if you want to come up and just share what you're hearing in your neighborhood, feel free, which I thought was a very good opportunity, so I went up and I, I just wanted to share, basically, Mr. Stout was very open, very friendly. He is the airport manager and he's been the architect of the growth there for some years now. Basically, the bottom line might be that they have from what he told me at least, is there's no real control in their part over the bigger carriers as to what their paths are. They can't impact that, nothing to be done. Uh, he mentioned that uh, the bottom line, of course, was that years ago this was part of the county general plan, the sequel was done, and that's that. Uh, so, you know, that, that door is closed. Uh, uh, the one thing he did hold out was that <clears throat> there's the potential to work towards what they call optimal flight paths. Again, this is, means this planes might fly in at a higher altitude as opposed to kind of stepping in like this. So there could be some potential for noise reduction, but this is something evidently that's voluntary somewhat to some degree, and I'm not sure how high a priority. So I just wanted to share this with you so you're aware. I, I do think ultimately, uh, seeing as I know we have some concerns in this community, I know that Sebastopol does, and I know that I've heard subsequently that Windsor is discussing the same issue. It's probably something that should come in front of us at some point, but I, rather than ask for it to come right away, I'd probably, if the council concerned, just ask staff to look into what sort of support, uh, what sort of consulting might be appropriate to help answer those questions about what actually can and can't be done, because uh, that's a difficult place. This is not an area of expertise for us, typically, uh, certainly as council members and even for our staff. So. I'll leave that with staff just to look at and think about, but it might be the type of thing that in the relatively near future, if we don't hear back from the airport that they're working, trying to resolve some noise issues, uh, it might be a good time to push more strongly on that. So I wanted to share that with you because I thought it would be of interest and I thought it might be interest to some of the neighbors who may or may not be, depending where you're living, you've noticed a huge increase in jet noise the last couple of years, 24 hours a day. So. So that's my report. I wish it was a little more cheerful, but that's what we have. Okay. Vice Mayor Moore. Uh, I have nothing to report. I have a REMF annual board meeting and training Thursday and Friday. Okay. Thank you. So I'll turn to this side. Uh, Council Member Harvey. Um, so I attended the Zero Waste Sonoma meeting and um, we discussed the draft work plan for 2021 and most of that's um, just uh, relatively operational and the same. But uh, one of the items that the staff's been working on that is will be of interest to some folks is uh, they're looking to place another household hazardous waste facility, um, in particular um, in the northern part of the county. 
and so they looked at some different properties and kind of did some research on other places that have gone through this because basically we've kind of outgrown what we have um, at Central and because it's at Central which is generally in the southern part of the county we really don't get um, very much use um, by the northern end but um, unfortunately in looking at that um, it sounds like it would be extremely expensive and when I talk extremely expensive it sounds like it's in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 million dollars um, to do that they even looked at some where there were existing buildings there that maybe could be repurposed and even that the remodel costs um, they were looking, you know, eight to ten million dollars to to re get them the way they need to be. So that's not looking really great at this point. So um, one of the things that um, we asked staff to look at and come back with is, you know, is there another way to slice this? Um, they've been real successful with with um, having uh, the roving household. Um, hazardous waste events and you know do we need to kind of start saving maybe for a facility but you know offer more of those to get um, the use up because um, that's a big amount of money just in relative terms um, it would mean um, adding um, three dollars and sixty cents per ton um, to our fee that we have so it would go from uh, it would go up to nine dollars um, to pay for that and that's you know not something that we you know take you know lightly so we're having staff you know take a look at that to see if, if there aren't some more cost-effective ways to kind of get the North County um, more engaged but more to come on that but I thought you'd find that interesting all right thank you Councilman Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, one issue to talk about, and that was the monthly Ag and Open Space District meeting. Um, the slate for chair, vice chair, and chair pro tem, um, all three got renewed. So uh, I think this is now the year four or five that I've been chair of Ag and Open Space Advisory Committee. So that was good. Uh, we spent most of the time talking about uh, the stewardship policy and a fee lands strategy you know in buying land when you're paying the fee price you know it's significantly more it's usually when you're buying conservation easements it's maybe 35 45 percent of the value of the land but you're purchasing it typically the development rights so you know it's not going to get it's going to be that way in perpetuity um, so the discussion was you know what happens in uh, 2030 2031, 2030, one of those years out there when the current measure will end. Um, and assuming it doesn't get renewed, although it's been renewed two or three times now by uh, the high 70 percentile by Sonoma County residents, uh, chances are you know it could still get renewed in the future. But if it doesn't, what happens with all of the lands um, that's now being held, either those in fee or you know, the issue with um, conservation easements is there in perpetuity. So there's got to be monitoring of easements forever on those parcels. So it's, um, it's a strategy to work out, you know, where's the money going to come from. And um, actually, things look pretty good. Uh, that's not to say that we wouldn't want to see the tax measure pass, because um, that would be the ultimate. And then we know it's, it's there for sure. But these guys. Um, it's an amazing staff they have up there. I mean, they they leverage the money that they have. Uh, there was a recent parcel, I can't remember exactly where, somewhere in eastern Santa Rosa, um, where it was like $4 million was put in by Ag and Open Space, which is, of course, approved by their board of directors, which is the board of supervisors. But they had $5 million in matching money. So they're really, really good at going out, and they've got a great reputation, too, uh, at going out and getting money to do these kinds of projects to secure lands, um, either for scenic value, recreational value, or agricultural use, continued agricultural use. And that's what I have. Thank you. 
Thanks. Okay, thank you. And then I just had a couple things. Uh, attended the League of California Cities uh, training in Sacramento on the 22nd and 24th. Um, I have not collated all of my notes, but I'll put together something just to report out about the general um, presentations that were done. And of course, we have all of the materials as well if anybody sees anything of interest. Then um, coming up actually tomorrow and uh, Thursday, Friday, I believe, um, I'm going to be uh, volunteering some time with the California Homemakers for their um, tamale fundraiser. Um, they, they take over the community kitchen at uh, Frog Song and uh, orders are, are quite lengthy for folks who are interested in purchasing them. So it's a good fun event. Uh, so that is all I have to report out. Um, so let's move on to item 14. Public comment on non-action agenda items. Uh, yes, Mr. Birch. I want to thank uh, Mr. Lamman for sharing that issue regarding uh, the flight path. We hope to hear more about that, so thank you, Mr. Lamman. As far as the future agenda items, I'd like to make a suggestion, uh, but first a little history might be in order. When I was on the City Council in 2009, well, before I was on the council, there was a policy that if any city council member wanted to put some, place something on the agenda, he or she could do that. That changed when I got on to the city council. In the 12 months that I was on the city council, not once was I able to put anything on the agenda, thanks to my colleagues on the city council and city manager Diane Thompson, who had her marching orders. But. The fact is, is uh, one of the things I tried to put on the agenda was uh, this uh, ban on non-recyclable uh, polystyrene food utensils and uh, styrofoam packing material. And I couldn't put that on the agenda. I couldn't put term limits on the agenda, yada, yada, it goes on and on. But uh, I think you need a policy that says when you're on the city council, you have a right to put something on the agenda. And if the item fails for uh, discussion, or doesn't go anywhere, that's just the way it is. But when that person represents a segment of the, the city, that person should have a voice. Last, we had a couple nice ladies come here tonight speaking about the animals over at the fake farm across the street. And I think what needed to be said, as shortly and succinctly as possible, is that we have no plan for that property. And we had a work, we had one workshop in this room with Mr. Deloso and I think Ms. Harvey, Mrs. Harvey, and there was so much discontent and so many unresolved issues from parking to tourism to whether it was going to be a petting zoo or a real farm with real livestock that was really slaughtered and eaten at one of our chicken queues here at City Hall or whatever we're going to do, that Mr. Deloso promised us all, don't worry, there's going to be more workshops. You can count on it. And I haven't seen one since, okay? And I've brought this up before. It's a cruel hoax on the community to keep telling people we got a plan, we don't have a plan. We don't have a budget. We don't know what's going to go on over there. We had a half million dollar fence put around that property that no farmer in his right mind would have built, but that's another issue. But you got to come clean about this fake farm. These people are going to get disillusioned, they're going to talk to people and find out that you guys are making it up as you go along, it's all being decided behind closed doors, and that's not the way this town should be working. We need to get back on track to, yes ma'am. Uh, get back on track to these workshops and come to an agreement on what we're really doing. All right, thank you for your comments. Anybody else wish to comment on non-action non agenda items? Yes, sir. This is pursuant to my La Plaza project. I didn't have time to expand one little phase of this. In the process of in developing this uh, lot, which has got one little house that's being developed. We have a vision for what else is going to be there. And one of, the, one of the thoughts that has been rumbling through my mind on this and people I pulled, well, what could we do with that that would really enhance it for the city? 
what would it be that would make a mark that would have a, a reason for an end destination for people to come to Katari? Is there anything that we could develop to make that goal happen? So it's been a struggle for me to see how uh, that could come together, and I was just wondering whether or not the city council or the, the city itself has some um, data of what the city might like to see, or is there surveys that have been done or could be sent out that says, you know, what, is the, what does the general public want to see? So that we can design and build something that's in keeping with that kind of mindset. So for me, it's a kind of a win-win. What can we do that brings in tourism or brings in business and it's an enhancement to the city? So that's my thought about why I bring this subject back up. So I yield to the, the folks here to, if you, you've got some ideas you want to share with me, or uh, I can give my contacts to whoever is the necessary person. Oh, I can do it with you. So I welcome any of your inputs along those lines. All right, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else on public comment on non-agenda items? All right, seeing none, I'll move public com or close public comment and move on to item number 15. Was there any information received after the agenda was posted? None? Okay, perfect. And then we will adjourn the meeting at 9.46. Thank you so much.